Good morning, everyone. This is a meeting of the, it, well, it's Thursday, January 21st, 8.30, the meeting of the Senate Natural Resources and Energy Committee. And we are joined this morning by our colleagues from the House Natural Resource Fish and Wildlife Committee. Uh, the, we'll be spending the morning uh, looking at executive order number 0221, a reorganization of the Natural Resources Board. Um, and uh, we're gonna be taking testimony uh, from a variety of people uh, getting help from legal counsel, as well as hearing from some people in the field, district commissioners and others, as well as the administration. Um, the administration had some time constraints in terms of when they could join us. So they'll be joining us in the middle of the morning. Uh, it might be more ideal if they've been able to go early on to sort of pitch the EO to us, but we'll work with the timing we have, even if it's a little awkward. Um, just for remind everyone of the basics. So if everyone could mute their uh, uh, speakers, if you're, if you're not the speaker at that moment, um, and we have a pretty good sized crew, so I'll call on people. I try to scan the, the screen for hands up. I think everyone knows that uh, down under the, uh, uh, how to you know put a yellow hand or a blue hand it seems to vary by by system sometimes, but if I don't recognize you, please just you know turn on your speaker and, and sing out uh, because sometimes I do miss the, the hand. So we have a lot of uh, testimony to cover this morning. In the next three hours, uh, we'll be going roughly an hour and taking a ten minute break and and repeating that through the morning. Uh, aiming to adjourn by 11.50 so that no one is jammed into any kind of noontime commitment. Um, we're gonna, I, I would ask people because we have so many of us and so many witnesses to talk with to um, not enter sort of full discussion mode where we ask lots of questions, but uh, at the same, so that we can make sure that we get through everyone's presentation. At the same time, if there's something that's unclear, please uh, do go ahead and, and ask because just like um, being in school, you know, when one person asks a question, there's usually other people in the classroom who would have liked to have heard that. They needed that same question asked on their behalf as well. Um, so uh, before we uh, go to our first uh, witnesses, I just wanted to, uh, uh, ask Chair Sheldon if she had anything she wanted to offer up. Um, not at this time. That was a good intro, and our committee did um, get a get a look at the executive order yesterday afternoon. But I don't think it will hurt us to hear some things again. So thank you for having us. And great. Um, and just a little bit more. Uh, well, I'm gonna. He just left the screen, but good morning, uh, former Representative Baser from my neighbor here in Bristol and a district commissioner. Sorry, once you left your chair, I was saying hello. Um, I'm back. For, <laughs> good to see you again. Um, in terms of framing what we're gonna be looking at, so we're really looking at, two, at the EO from two different perspectives. One is the content, so what is the EO proposed to do and why? You know, that gets into an examination of its merits, uh, just as an idea, a good idea can come from anywhere. So is this a good idea? Uh, but there's also a process element to it. And that is, does this EO conform to the statutory process that we all, uh, legislator, legislators and the executive branch alike are uh, obligated to follow? Um, and as we address these uh, two aspects, we're gonna, start with our legal team, um, uh, Ms. Schakowsky, Mr. Martland, and uh, Ms. Arajali to uh, look at both content and process. And then we'll move on to witnesses who are here primarily to talk about um, uh, content, I think today. But so with all that teed up, I'd like to uh, turn to Ms. Tchaikovsky, and um, and I figure that you, uh, Ms. Albergeli, and Mr. Martland will switch back and forth as you need to. We can leave this pretty fluid as to 
um, how you help one another cover all the territory we need to cover this morning. So with that. Sure, although would it be, uh, so Ellen Tchaikovsky, Office of Legislative Council, would it be most helpful to have Luke and Amarin start with the legal framework or would you like me to talk about the details of the uh, text of the EO's policy proposal? Um, I thought if we would just start with the, to make sure everyone knows the content side uh, sure. first before we get into the, the legal intricacies of, of how it works or doesn't work, you know, that kind of thing. Thank you. All right, so good morning. This is, uh, can you see my shared screen of the PowerPoint? Yes, thank you. Okay. So uh, this PowerPoint is similar, um, almost identical to the one I gave yesterday in House Natural Resources. Um, uh, there was one typo that I will point out as we go. So um, Executive Order 2-21, uh, a reorganization of the Natural Resources Board was signed on uh, a week ago, uh, January 14th. Uh, it is the authority for this, uh, my colleagues will talk about, uh, is under 3000, uh, 3 VSA 2002, and that sets a 90 day parameter to for the legislature to respond. And uh, um, we'll talk about that more momentarily, but uh, the structure of the EOS is similar to how your resolutions uh, look. It starts with a few whereas clauses and those clauses set out um, some of the justification, um, some of the history of the Act 250 program and uh, a little bit of the policy details. But then there is a now therefore section which lists um, the details of the proposal. So uh, there are nine now therefore paragraphs. So now, therefore, the governor uh, reorganize, proposes to reorganize the Natural Resources Board and the district commissions as follows. Starting on July 1, 2021, the Natural Resources Board changes from five members to three full-time professional members. Um, I did also under my name for today on your website, this presentation appears, but also the chart uh, that Senator Westman uh, requested detailing sort of uh, a visual side by side. Um, that is up there too, and we can talk about that more later. But to start, the current Natural Resources Board has a full time chair and four other members that are uh, that receive per diem and necessary expenses. The chair of the current Natural Resources Board sh uh, serves at the pleasure of the governor, while the other four members are removable for cause only. Paragraph two abolishes the current board and transfer, transfers its duties and authority to the new board. Paragraph three, the new chair and two members shall be appointed by the governor with the advice and consent of the Senate. They shall serve at the pleasure of the governor and have six year terms. They shall have staggered initial terms and be full-time exempt employees. So uh, this is one of the major changes. Um, we're going from five members to three members. Those members will be full-time professional employees, um, but they will all three all serve at the pleasure of the governor, as opposed to the current structure, which has removable for cause only. Also in paragraph three, when the board takes up an application, two district commissioners from the district where the project is located, join the board as voting members. So. The ch and the chair of that district commission shall select which members participate. So that means it is a board of five people reviewing an application, but each application will have a slightly different um, makeup of a board reviewing it. Paragraph four, the district commissioner's authority to decide an whether an application is a major or a minor application is transferred to the board. No input from the district commissions Paragraph five, the district commission's authority to decide whether to issue an administrative amendment is transferred to the board. No input from the district commissions. Paragraph six, 
The district commission's authority over major applications and minor applications with the hearing, that is also transferred to the board. Um, and we'll come back to that on the next slide quickly. Um, paragraph seven, the statutes, rules, policies, and procedures relating to applications shall be transferred to the new board. Paragraph eight, an applicant may seek reconsideration of a jurisdictional opinion um, that has been issued by a district coordinator from the board. Um, so I wanna point out to the members of the house, um, yesterday I sort of mischaracterized this process a little bit. So um, a person may request a jurisdictional opinion currently, and that goes to the district coordinator. Uh, when once that has been issued, a re they may request the the person requesting may request a reconsideration, uh, and that is uh, cur currently done by the district coordinator. Also, someone can also um, appeal the JO directly to the court. Um, so the reconsideration is an optional step, um, but under this policy proposal in the EO. Uh, reconsideration is now done by the board. And then finally, in paragraph nine, applications made before July 1 remain with the district commission. So uh, this is a pretty short executive order. It's only uh, this, this section, these nine paragraphs is only about a page and a half, but there is a lot of um, policy sort of change happening here. Um, so then I wanted to mention in reading the, the text of the executive order, it appeared to me at least initially that all of the district commission's authority was being transferred to the board. Um, but then in rereading one of the whereas clauses states that major applications will be sent to the board. And then further in the press release associated with the executive order, there, it states that minor applications will remain with the district commissions. So um, in this being a short executive order, a lot of the details are not included, uh, but I, I think that what's happening here is because the new board is being vested with all of this authority, they will have the authority to delegate some of that authority back to the district commission. Um, so there are some details that may need to be filled in and um, should this policy, uh, should this executive order proposal go into effect, there will probably need to be legislation conforming the statutes, amending um, all of this in statute. So some of the details can be discussed then. Um, and also, so this proposal should sound a little bit familiar, although your committee did not review it last year or the, the Senate committee did not review it last year, um, it was, uh, a very similar proposal was made to House Natural Resources last year. Last January, it was proposed by the, um, the administration uh, and VNRC. Uh, the House Committee worked on that proposal for about six weeks and did include it in the version of H926 that the committee voted out um, last February. Um, as we've talked about briefly on Friday, um, after H-926 left House Natural Resources, uh, it went to House Ways and Means, but also House Appropriations. And the proposal for the new board was removed by House Appropriations in its strike all amendment. And then finally, just as a reminder, um, uh, H-926 was passed. You recall, we spent a lot of time working on that. And the governor vetoed H-926 on October 5th, 2020, and issued Executive Order 0420. Uh, in his veto message of H-926, he stated that he was issuing uh, EO 420 um, to address interim trail policy, uh, recreational trail policy, and he adopted uh, some of the recreational trail policy that was in H-926. So it's worth pointing out that this is the second time in three months that the governor has issued an executive order um, proposing to adopt some of the Act 250 policy that your committee worked on last year. And that is all I have in this uh, slide. So that's the overview of the 
policy proposal in the text of the executive order. Okay. Um, can you, are you able to put up your side by side so we could take a look at that together as well? Sure. Uh, can no, I just, this is, yeah, can, Senator Westman. Can I just butt in and say thank you to her for doing that? You are welcome. Can you see it yes. on the screen? Let me yep. see if I can make it a little bit bigger. Um, so, um, so one of the, I mean, one of the challenges I've already sort of mentioned is that this is a, a an executive order that contains a lot of information in a short uh, document. So I, I think I've captured all of it in this chart, but this chart is not. Um, does not describe the Act 250 pro, uh, program and process um, completely. Um, I tried to sort of stick to one of the things that are being discussed in the executive order. So, um, so this should all largely be redundant to what I just said. Um, it starts with the Natural Resources Board. Um, the, the left or middle column is the existing structure. And um, the far right column has what is contained in the executive orders proposal. So current structure, five members, one full-time chair, four members who receive per diem and expenses, appointed by the governor with advice and consent of the Senate. Um, the EO proposes three full-time um, exempt employee members, uh, all appointed by the governor with the advice and consent of the Senate. Um, all of those, again, being uh, employees that serve at the pleasure of the governor, whereas the current structure has the chair serving at the pleasure of the governor with the other four members being removable for cause only. Um, another sort of small detail is that currently in the, um, in 6021, um, the, the statute says in making these appointments, the governor and the Senate shall give consideration to experience, expertise, or skills relating to the environment or land use. Um, in the executive order, uh, in addition to those uh, skills in environment or land use, uh, it, it also adds geographic, gender, ethnic, or racial diversity. Um, and that actually was a phrase that was added um, in H926. So that is um, language that should seem familiar. Okay. Um, I didn't ask you this question before today, but do you know anything about the history of, can you say a little bit about serves at the pleasure of versus removable for cause? I don't know if anyone has been removed for cause. Um, they're all, it, so that's one question. And the other one that goes with it is, are all the appointments made by the governor, whenever a seat opens, whether at the district commission level or on the board level, are all the appointments made by the governor? Uh, yes, so at least as it's, it is stated in statute, um, I was gonna talk about the district commissions next, but all of them are currently um, appointed by the governor. Um, the phrase removable for cause only is, um, I am not an expert on the, the nuances of employment law, but one of the differences is there is a, at least an appearance of being insulated, you know, um, from, uh, pers from uh, personal or political pressure. Um, so that is a difference. Serving at, uh, serving at the pleasure of the governor allows the governor to remove that person at any time from the office, I believe without having to state a reason as opposed to um, cause needs to have a clear um, reason associated with it. So I can, I can look into more of that um, also for, I can do some more research on that for you also. Okay, thanks. Um, yeah, sorry, I interrupted with that question, so. Um, so then as far as the district commissions go, um, there are nine environmental district commissions established in statute. Uh, it does not appear that any of the structures are changing. Um, 
that at least is not mentioned in the executive order. So um, it's, it's unclear, but they're, they're not referenced. Um, each consists of a chair and two members, which are appointed by the governor. The chair serves for a four-year term and serves at the, pl uh, the pleasure of the governor. The other two district commissioners have two-year terms and are removable for cause only. So none of this is discussed directly in the EO. So it's, um, I, I sort of assume that it is unchanged. Um, next, jurisdictional opinions. I did just touch on that in the slideshow. So a district coordinator issues a district uh, just jurisdictional opinion when someone asks for one. Um, the applicant or the requester can request a reconsideration of the JO once it's been issued. And the currently the district coordinator does that. Uh, they also could appeal directly to the environmental court. Uh, as I mentioned, the executive order is proposing to change uh, who does the reconsideration. That, cha that will now be done by the board if requested. Um, so then the permit application process is changing under the EO as proposed. So currently a permit application is submitted to a district commission where the project is located. Uh, the text of the, uh, the EO states that the permit will now be submitted, the permit application will be submitted to the new board. Currently, the district commission determines if that application is a major application, a minor application, or would um, fall as a administrative amendment, which is a, a much shorter, quicker process. Um, the, under the new uh, proposal in the executive order, the new board determines if it's a major, minor, or administrative amendment. And then uh, the district commission from the district where the project is located reviews that application and decides whether to issue an, a permit. Uh, they're also the ones that conduct any hearings that would be needed on that permit application. Under the new, under the uh, executive order, the new board plus two district commissioners from the district where the project is located review major applications and decide whether to issue a permit. The chair of the district commission selects which two district commissioners will join the board for each application. Um, and then finally, appeals. Um, appeals are not mentioned in the executive order, um, but currently permit decisions uh, are appealable to the environmental division of the superior court. Uh, subsequent appeals are made to the Supreme Court. So it does not appear that that is changing under the EO, but it is not discussed. Great. Well, thank you very much. And I know that this is not your proposal, so it's a little awkward to ask you to explain someone else's proposal, especially when the language of the EO is a bit terse. So uh, we'll have the administration in to um, dig into that further. Um, any questions in the room for Ms. Tchaikovsky before we uh, switch over and start looking at the, the, the legal side? Uh, from with Mr. Martland and Ms. Abergele. Okay, so thank you and let's uh, move on. And uh, I don't know who of council is gonna go, go next, Mr. Martland, are you uh, walking yes, us I'll, through? I'll begin that and thank you very much. And good morning, everyone, Luke Martland. Director of Legislative Council and Chief Counsel to the General Assembly. And I'm joined not only by Ellen, who you've heard from, but also my colleague, Amarin. And we'll be discussing the process. And for those of you on the House Committee, you've heard this testimony yesterday. I still will run through it so the Senate Committee can hear the same information, but we'll try to be quick. As the chair began, uh, his introductory remarks, we welcome questions. I'll leave that up to the chair to recognize anyone who raises their hand. But if anything I say or we say is unclear, please ask us a question. So as Ellen alluded to, there's a process for the House and the Senate to consider an executive order that reorganizes uh, the functions or duties of the executive branch. And that is set forth in Title III, 
chapter 41. Pursuant to that chapter, the governor may propose changes in the organization of the executive branch or in the, in the assignment of functions among its units that he or she considers necessary for efficient administration. And the procedure to follow is set forth in 3 VSA 2002. That statute states that the executive order proposing such a reorganization must be submitted to both the House and the Senate on or before January 15th of the year. The proposed reorganization will then become effective, quote, unless disapproved by resolution by either House of the General Assembly within 90 days or before final adjournment of that annual session, whichever comes first, end quote. The remaining sections of this chapter, 3 VSA 2003 through 2007, concern other issues, for example, uh, appropriations, how money follows any reorganization, terms of appointees, and other issues that I don't think are relevant to the committee's discussion today, but we could always answer questions if you think that information is relevant. So therefore, in sum, the process set forth in statute is quite straightforward. Number one, the, government, the governor must issue the executive order before January 15th, which was done in this case. Number two, the executive order may propose reorganization to executive branch agencies or departments. Number three, if either the House or the Senate, <clears throat> excuse me, passes a resolution within 90 days or before adjournment, disapproving the executive order, the reorganization does not go into effect. And number four, if neither the House or Senate does so, then the executive order will go into effect and the reorganization will take place. Now in the memo that all of you have been provided, we give a little context. Uh, this statute has been in effect for approximately 50 years. It's been used uh, multiple times by multiple administrations. It's been used previously by Governor Scott. And we summarize that in the paragraph on page two. I won't go into that today unless there's a question, but it is a statute that has been used multiple times. And some of those executive orders have gone into effect and others have been disapproved by a resolution of either the House or the Senate. I would pause here for a moment to see if there's any questions. Uh, Senator McDonald. For, for those listening in from the public and to put it into more less uh, legal terms, um, if you were in a used car lot, you might say take it or leave it. And uh, if this were in the legislature or, or a committee, the chair would say hearing no objection. Is that basically what we have before us? Something that we could either take or leave or um, takes place unless we object? Well, let me <clears throat> break that down a little bit because you raise a question that I think hits on another question we heard yesterday. So first of all, is it take it or leave it in the sense that you can amend the EO? And our answer is we believe not. The EO as it is, is take it or leave it. You can't amend it or change it. But if you like what the EO does, you do nothing. And if the House does nothing and the Senate does nothing, it goes into effect. If you don't like what the EO does for whatever reason, then one body would pass a resolution disapproving it and it would not go into effect. Did that answer your question, Senator? I believe you're muted. He looks contented. Okay. Yes, it answers my question. We can, either the House or the Senate can take it or leave it. Thank you. Yes, thank you. So the other, only other point that I, I would make, and this is on page two and three of the memo, is that there is an inaccuracy in the language of both executive orders. They state that both houses must pass the resolution disapproving the EO. That is incorrect. 
under the clear terms of the statute that I read to you a few moments ago, it's either body. So either the House or the Senate passes a resolution disapproving the EO. It does not go into effect. And I'd um, ask Amarin if she has any comments, but otherwise that concludes uh, my summary of the procedure. I do not, thank you. Thank you. Um, I have a quick question, Mr. Martland. Uh, the, on the previous uh, EOs in, in, issued by this administration, did they include the language that asserted that both bodies needed to object in order to disapprove of the EO? No, they did not. So both okay. EOs before the General Assembly currently have identical language. The executive orders from 2017 also had uh, language that was identical between those three EOs, but it was different. And what it merely stated was that the EO in the EOs in 2017 would go into effect unless disapproved by the General Assembly. And then there was a citation to the statute. So that phrasing we think is substantially accurate. The phrasing in the current EOs is not accurate. Okay. Thank you. And are you or Ms. Abergeli going to uh, speak about the uh, extent of change contemplated by this EO versus the intent of 3VSA 2000? one and two. Um. I, I don't know if that's our, our role. I think actually probably the person who could give you most information about that would be Ellen. If you're asking what the line is between reorganization and substantive policy changes, I think that's a little bit of a gray area because if you're making organizational changes that could indeed uh, lead to substantive changes. So I don't think legally we can tell you exactly where that line is, but I think as Ellen has very um, carefully put in front of you, the impact of these organizational changes is broad and it does hit a number of different areas. Right. Um, thank you. Any questions for Mr. Martland or Ms. Robert Jedley? Uh, Senator McCormick. Thanks. Um, I understand the 90 day deadline for the legislature to act or not. And, but what, what is the purpose of the deadline for the governor to issue the executive order in the first place? I believe you said January 15th. Yes, that's accurate. Well, that's what, simply, what is the purpose of that? I can't comment on the purpose that's in statute. The statute was passed in 1970. So I, I'm sorry, I can't tell you the purpose for that, but that is, very well, clearly set forth in the statute. Yeah. Let me rephrase the question then. What, what, is, what is the function of that? What impact does that have? I, I think I'd give you the same answer. The impact is if it's done on January 16th, it's too late. If it's done on January 14th, it's, uh, it's in time. And that's what happened in this case. No, I, I understand that. Okay. Okay. Yeah. You don't, this is outside your bailiwick, and I get you. Yes. Okay, um, Representative uh, Dolan. Thank you and good morning. My question is about precedent. Say that this executive order goes into law either through um, uh, lack of action on, on the executive order. How does it affect that inconsistency, that, in, that inaccuracy that you pointed out? Does it become precedent for future executive orders? Or as, as you had pointed out, it, we would need to respond anyway to change in statute to support the executive order. Uh, I presume it would, it may trigger uh, a relook at that particular language. So as to your question about precedent, I can't comment from the executive branch's perspective. Um, so maybe they would think that it would establish precedent for future EOs. As far as interpreting the statute, I don't think it would change what the statute says. And if this, case, if this statute was ever litigated, I think a court would look at the clear wording of the statute and perhaps any prior cases. And I cite 
in the memo, the only case we're aware of uh, that interprets a statute. So as far as a court would go, I don't think the EO would have much precedential value. Um, your, their argument, or I shouldn't say their argument, their language in EO, as I indicate in the memo in a footnote, is sort of having it more than one way simultaneously. And it seems to be an effort to raise the bar or seem to raise the bar for you in the General Assembly and what you must do to disapprove it. So it's not only inaccurate, I think as your attorney, uh, as Ellen and myself and Amarin as your attorneys, uh, we don't think you should go along with this incorrect interpretation of law. And that's separate from whether you allow this to uh, go into effect or not. It might be something you consider where you respond to this inaccurate uh, interpretation of the statute. But I don't think it has much precedential value for the future. Your other question was about uh, amending the statute. Of course, you could do that. Um, or amending other statutes to comply with the executive order. We think you should do that if the executive order goes into effect. That is what you've done in the past with executive orders. And we think that's important to make sure that statutes comply with any organizational changes. Thank you. Uh, Senator Westman. Um, so because there, I heard the, um, the um, 15th deadline, does that mean that if um, um, the governor's office wanted to reissue the order that that's impossible until next year? I believe so. I mean, I think this, they've submitted their two executive orders. That's it. I don't think they can come out with a new one or uh, rework so, this and reissue it. I don't believe they so, can. So, so there's no, upper, it's either up or down for us. Um, you question, um, um, you've raised the question of whether or not this is, um, you know, and this is not the best terminology, but from a lay person, whether this is legal that they did this anyways. And so it's up or down for us and, and there's no opportunity to negotiate with them to come back with anything. As far as approving the executive order, I believe it is up or down. You either let it go into effect or you disapprove it. And as I said earlier, I don't think you can amend it. I don't think they can come back with a new and modified executive order. Of course, it could be the beginning of a discussion that ultimately results in statutory change, which has happened I, 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 in the I, past. I, 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 I get that, but I'm, what I'm just trying to figure out is in this realm, in this avenue that has been taken, it's it's either accept or reject. And um, in this process, other than going through a statute change is um, basically, in your opinion, a dead alley. I'm sorry, I, I don't know what you mean by dead alley. Um, they can't reissue. Uh, we couldn't negotiate for them to. Uh, it has. It would have to be through statute. Uh, yes, that is my point of view. Yes. Okay. Uh, Senator Campion. Thanks, Mr. Chair. I'm sorry. I may have missed this early earlier, uh, Mr. Marlin. When you were speaking with Senator Westman, did you say that that you believe there's a legal issue with them? having even put the EO forward? No, no. Uh, and sorry if I was unclear. No, no. They met the deadline in statute. Yeah. So they're submitting the, these EOs to you was exactly. proper. It complied with the statutory deadline. No problem there. Okay. The only legal issue we raised was their uh, interpretation of whether both bodies need to disapprove it or not. Right. Thank you so much. Thank you. Okay. Uh, uh, Representative, that was helpful. Yeah. Uh, Representative Lefebvre. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, uh, if an executive order is rejected by the legislature, can it be brought back in the form of a bill? Yes. I mean, obviously, it'd be a different vehicle, but yes, the same idea could be advanced. Uh, pursuant to a bill. 
Thank you. Okay. Um, I don't see any more Mr. question. Chair. Yes, uh, Senator McDonald. No. Um, if, if I may, um, often there are times when there's a general consensus about what ought to happen. The legislators of both parties and various committees agree. Um, people are in accord. Um, and in those cases, in order to save time and energy, um, governors are perhaps even urged by all the ones I just mentioned to put through a fourth an executive order and um, all sorts of time and effort is removed and everybody leaves happy. Um, so I guess the, the question before both the uh, um, House and the Senate is um, whether or not this is one of those times. Thank you. Uh, any one else have a question for council before we uh, change gears here and hear from some of our other guests this morning? Okay, so thank you, Ms. Chakowsky, Ms. Abrajali, and Mr. Markland. Um, will you be staying with us for the balance of the morning or part of it? Okay, so great. Uh, I'm hoping that when we wrap up this morning, we'll also return to uh, discussions with council. I'm guessing that by at that point, we might have questions to put on uh, to ask them to look into things after we've heard all the other testimony. Um, or you may have new questions by then, having heard the administration, for instance, and from our folks in the field. Um, so our next scheduled uh, guest is uh, Mr. Stanek, and I don't see him in the room at the moment. So just let me check with Jude to make sure that I'm not missing something. Uh, no. Mr. Stanek has not no. arrived. No. Okay. All right. Well, we'll see what happens there. Maybe he's going to come in later. Uh, we'll then move on to our our next witness, and that is uh, uh, Annette Smith. Good morning, Ms. Smith. Um, and just to let people know, timing-wise, so it's 9.15. The, we're going to uh, have a break just before 10, and the administration's coming in at 10. So that gives us about 40 minutes with three guests. I'll ask people to aim for about 10 minutes uh, uh, of testimony and a little Q&A time. Um, if we need more, we'll find a way to get it. But for now, on our first survey of the bill and hearing from folks out in the field, we'll try to get cover the landscape, even if a little briefly. So good morning, Ms. Smith. Please go ahead. Good morning, and thank you all for hearing from me today. I appreciate the invitation. My name is Annette Smith. I'm Executive Director of Vermonters for a Clean Environment. Um, I have a hard stop at 930 because I am going to join a PUC workshop on their rule change. And I'm, my goal is to try and make it more friendly to citizens. And here I'm talking to you about a pro proposal that actually makes it less friendly to citizens. Um, so let's see, here we go. There's some interesting history here. Um, the governor's authority to reorganize the executive branch was granted by Act 245 signed by Governor Davis a few minutes before he signed Act 250. And then the next act in the series created the Agency of Natural Resources. I do, want, I do think the findings are relevant. Uh, this is an excerpt from one of the findings that uh, resulted from Act 246. And that is that it is the goal of reorganization through coordination of government programs and policies to improve the relationship between citizens and government agencies. So this proposal weakens that relationship and is, it clearly applies to Act 250. And it, it also makes the government less accessible to citizens. These are the more detailed findings. There are, there are some more that I left out, uh, the underlined parts within the policy limits established by the legislature and should assure res its responsiveness to popular control to carry out these policies. Uh, administration of policies established by the legislature. Now, I, I did uh, focus groups with citizens about Act 250 in 2003, and 
overwhelmingly, everyone said the district commission process is the best thing about Act 250. It's what really makes it work. And so the idea of eliminating the role of hearings by district commissions is very concerning. So the governor's executive order improperly interferes with the legislature's established policy for the role of district commissions. Um, it's provided in chapter 151 as an essential part of legislative policy. It's, this order strips the district commissions of many of their functions and also a non-professional board like the NRB is part of the policy established by the legislature. Uh, as uh, this is somewhat redundant, so I'll move on quickly, but the, um, the, this is the history of what happened. The, the big difference between what passed out of the Natural Resource Fish and Wildlife Committee and this executive order is that the appointment process was using the judicial nominating board and not serving at the pleasure of the governor. This slide could be titled, Act 250 is broken right now. It is, it's not fully staffed. Uh, it, the commissioner positions are not being filled. Some expired terms aren't filled. There, the political appointment process is resulting in political appointments. And so you see that with each administration. This is a short list. I could go on and on about the issues that need to be looked at right now with how Act 250 is being administered. It's being degraded to the point that, for instance, with party status, I'm beginning to realize that I think it's easier to get standing at the Public Utility Commission than it is in Act 250. And that's, that should concern everyone. The, the citizen participation in Act 250 is greatly reduced. Uh, there, there's no open application process for district commissioners. We have a lot of talent in Vermont and that's something to, to look at. This is probably the most important uh, part that I have to offer you. And that is that in terms of this executive order, if you allow it to take effect, then you are also out of sync with your budgeting process. This proposal involves, it, last year, the salaries were $145,000 each, plus equivalent payments for two district commissioners. They were proposed to be paid for by large fee increases that would uh, all be paid by all applicants, but only the majors would benefit from this professional board as, as it is proposed in the EO. And so I believe that your consideration of the merits of this proposal should occur only after disapproval of the EO. And then you can consider it and other ideas as part of your normal legislative process, which includes budgeting. But if this EO does not allow time for the legislature to make changes prior to April 15th, when your, your budgeting process still, in my experience, usually goes on until mid-May or later. And so allowing this to go in without grappling with all of the other issues with Act 250 and the budgets for the NRB. And, and it, it just does not make any sense for you to allow this to go into effect. And Ed Stanick gave excellent testimony, and I believe that link will work, that uh, goes into the numbers and, and provides some further insight into uh, this uh, fee business. And it, it talked about the number of cases so uh, that is my uh, input for today, but I would strongly uh, recommend that you uh, uh, disapprove this and then move on with your work. Last year, we were, you know, 2018 had the Commission on Active 50. It did good work. 2019, the House Committee started grappling with all these really complicated issues. They did a good job developing a bill and then everybody was blindsided by this deal, which derailed their good process. And now here we go again. I mean, we need an honest legislative process about updating Act 250. Nobody disagrees that we shouldn't be making changes to Act 250, but let's do it in a, a typical legislative process where it's, it's not already predetermined what the outcome is going to be. There are huge problems with this professional board idea as we have seen with how challenging it is to participate at the Public Utility Commission, there are great stories about the district commission process enabling the average Vermonter to show up at a hearing, be heard, not have to have a lawyer. It cuts the cost for everyone. There's a lot of money involved in this proposal. And I, I think that that's a, a, a big factor, but the most important part of it is how do we have an accessible process because 
when it comes to protecting the environment, it is the citizens who are protecting their neighborhoods. And they're called NIMBYs and they're told that they, you know, they, they're just selfish. But it, when, it, when you actually look at it, it is the people who live in the area who know the most about it, who are the, the, the best witnesses at the district commission and you don't have to have a lawyer to do it. So I, I really appreciate you hearing from me and thank you, I'm available for any questions. Okay, um, any questions for Ms. Smith? Okay, well, thank you for um, highlighting the interesting connection between the underlying statute to reorganize and its connection to Act 250 itself. Uh, it's illuminating. So, uh, you know, I, I do have a quick question. It's a little bit off your uh, presentation, but one of the uh, other uh, concerns I've heard expressed is that district commissions may issue rulings that are quote unquote inconsistent. And I don't know if you've given any thought to the notion that um, that inconsistency may be a question of perspective. One person might say this is a that brings a local voice to a local project, so that's you know, something like local control or local culture, local ethos, whatever we want to call it, and therefore it's appropriate versus um, uh, it's inconsistent because a similar project was judged differently in Maidstone versus in South Burlington. So is this fit into your examination so far of Act 250 and Yes, and, and I should say that I've been a student of permit reform since 2000. It's like every two years it comes up. So I've got files and I've, it's like we're living in Groundhog Day. Um, so this is something that we've heard over and over again. So I have two responses to it. Whatever issues there are with inconsistency in how the commissions are run can be addressed by better training. There, there's no reason not to have training for commissioners. And I do think that the commissioner's per diem should be increased as it was proposed last year. Uh, the other answer I have is that I have now in the last 20 years worked all over Vermont. And I will say that every town has its own personality. Every region has its own personality. And what goes on in my county of Rutland County is very different from what is happening in, for instance, Chittenden County. And when I did my focus groups, I went to I don't know, eight different regions. And it was only when we got to Chittenden County that we started dealing with housing developments. Everywhere else, it was quarries and transfer stations and, and you know, things that are affect, affect rural areas. And so I think that Act 50 was designed by its nature to be able to have each region reflect its regional differences. And by trying to centralize it and make it one uh, overall guidance for the state, you're ignoring the fact that every region really does have its, its unique aspects to it. And I think that it's something that uh, is a benefit to the state and not a detriment. Okay, well, great. Well, thank you very much for fitting us in. Uh, good luck across the street, uh, quote unquote, across the street at the PUC. And thank you. Um, thank you. Yeah, I'm just gonna take a quick look and make sure I'm not overlooking anybody's hand. Okay, so thank you, Ms. Smith. Um, you with that, I'd like to move on to uh, welcome former representative Fred Baser to the committee and uh, my neighbor. It's nice to see you, Fred, without a mask on when we're out on the street. We're both masked. Um, and you're the chair of District 9, isn't that right? So, so sure. please. Um, You've heard how we've covered so far. Love to hear, you know, now from district commission folks who are doing this work day by day to hear about the proposal. And I'll just add one more little lead in. Um, sometimes I think the struggle we go through with Act 250 discussions and reform is a lack of a clear definition of the problem being solved. I'm not really sure. Uh, and we'll ask the administration this, uh, what problem they're seeking to address in this EO. Um, but as someone out in the field doing this work, it would be helpful for all of us to hear your take on the EO. And, um, sure. well, that, that was a you. perfect segue, uh, Mr. Chair, to, to, I guess, really what I wanted to focus on. Um, 
I uh, had a conversation with Commissioner Porter a few days ago. He called me and he clearly outlined the reasons why they wanted to make this change to the process, changing the commission structure. Uh, number one was the consistency issue in, in permit uh, rulings. Uh, and two was to bring some expertise and technical knowledge to, to, the commission, uh, to the commissions acting on applications throughout the state. From my perspective, I've, I've, been a, uh, I've been the chair of the District 9 Commission, which is Addison County, uh, for two years. Uh, some have been longer, some have been less, but I think I have a pretty good grasp of the process. And uh, to Annette's point, um, and yours, I think, uh, the perspective is important. People are all different, um, and uh, you're going to get different perspectives from different parts of the state. It happens in many important areas. Look at the judicial system. Is, does, does every uh, court case come out exactly the same? It doesn't. Uh, they can they can vary quite a bit, um, uh, given given what's been put forward. Um, and I'll give you an example of the the localness and the influence that it can have on decision making. In 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 statute, there's a clear ability for fees to be charged for more cars being generated by a project, so that VTrans can perhaps put a roundabout or a light or something like that on a major state thoroughfare. Uh, we had an application for uh, an industry in Middlebury that, uh, because of the number of employees, was going to trip this law being effective, and, and a handsome five-digit number in, uh, in extra fees was going to be paid because of what would what all the traffic uh, that might exit the, the entity and go down the road and hit Route 7. Um, what the law, in its strictest sense, uh, uh, didn't note was that there is actually two outlets on this industrial avenue that the uh, that this new building and its employees would have. Uh, one was to Route 7, but one was to local roads where there were actually, once it hit a certain intersection, three places for people to go. And it was on, it was on the other access other than Route 7 where the commercial activity and most of the residents in Middlebury were located. So we felt that the, the, uh, we would modify, and we did modify um, fairly significantly, uh, the fee that was going to be charged due to the VTrans uh, scenario, because we felt it was uh, burdensome and wasn't accurate given uh, the alternatives workers would have. Um, perhaps in another community and another set of circumstances, uh, that wouldn't have happened, and the full fee would have been charged. It happens reasonably regularly, from what I understand, where you're going to have local situations that that uh, that demand uh, or suggest changes, um, and I think it's a positive thing. Um, concerning the uh, professionalism and technical expertise, when I first heard that as the commission chair, um, I, I said, you know, do they think we're stupid? Uh, do, do they, you know, do, do, does, does the governor's office think that Fred Baser, uh, uh, Tim Taylor, and so many others don't have good common sense? Uh, I think we all do. I can't speak to every commission and every commission chair, but I work hard to try to understand what's going on. And the way, the way things work now, we have a lot of expertise available to us. Um, you have the district coordinator, you have legal as part of the Natural Resource Board. Uh, you have the ability to access uh, uh, state commissions, uh, whether it's whether it's um, uh, archaeological, whether it's uh, natural resource oriented when it comes to water control, etc. All these things are available to us, and there's a process that allows us to ask those questions of those folks. Plus, applicants almost always, especially in a major scenario, bring experts, quote unquote, to the, to the table to give us their interpretation or their understanding of you know, the back corridor and if we change it or is it sufficient, et cetera, et cetera. So that 
someone with common sense and reasonable intelligence, you don't need a PhD, um, serving on a commission, has access to, to information that can be presented to us in layman's terms so that we can do the work to make common sense decisions um, on whether a development is appropriate or not, or, and if it's appropriate, whether there's some things that need to be modified in order to protect the environment or protect neighbors or whatever the case might be. Um, also to Annette's point, uh, when, when the commissions were established decades ago by some very good people, I think uh, Senator Gibb from our Addison County once again was very active in this. I think they did made good sense in having citizens, basically volunteers, of the public uh, to be the ones that are gonna sit down and look at projects that fall under the Act 250 jurisdiction and make decisions on how these things will impact their neighbors, how these things are gonna impact the environment. And I think that grassroots, if you will, decision-making on important matters is one of the strengths that Vermont has always had. I don't know what's happened in the last decades uh, that, that would warrant making this kind of a change for a full-time a full-time board basically and stripping, as I understand, most of the responsibilities that local commissioners might have with the exception of hearings when it comes to majors. Uh, the last point I guess I wanted to make was the way things are here is the chemistry between three full-time people who are making over 100K um, to do their work paired with two local commissioners who are basically are volunteers uh, and, and making a decision on a major application. Every bone in my body instincts say that is awkward. That's an awkward scenario, you know? Um, and to take it a step further with nine commissions around the state or districts around the state, they have the potential of working with a minimum of 18 different people, assuming there's a major in every district and since there are more than three commissioners, we have, we have six in Addison County at the moment uh, because you have alternates to deal with things like uh, people recusing themselves. They, they could have 26, 30 different commissioners that they would be dealing with on the local basis. From a communication standpoint, both ways, I think that's a very awkward situation. Um, Lastly, I, I had sent something to Jude, which she may pass out, with some quick questions I had on the process that the governor outlined. You touched, it was some, some of it was touched on by Ledge Council. You know, who can fire the full-time commissioners and under what circumstances? Um, uh, what happens if a full-time commissioner recuses themselves? Now you have four, an even number, not desirable. Uh, so how would, how would that be dealt with if a full-time commissioner feels they have a conflict of interest in, in taking up an application? Um, could two, the two local commissioners be paid? Um, uh, I can tell you there's going to be a problem in recruiting local commissioners with this. I had asked someone, because we had a vacancy, just days before the executive order, and I got an email from the person I had asked to consider serving on our commission saying, you know, with the governor's, governor's executive order, is, it, is there any merit? Should I move on? Uh, and, and I said, well, let's wait until the legislature deals with this. But uh, I, I think it might be hard to, to recruit local commissioners uh, given the status that they're going to have here. Um, uh, uh, Mr. Beaner, just so all this is, is another issue yeah. which was also brought up. Right. Um, the recruitment, just so I understand, are you saying if it turns out that local the, the district commissions will re be relegated to just doing amendments or minors that are referred back to it by the full board, um, it, it, are you saying that that'll make it harder because the, the mix of work is going to be uh, changed compared to what you have now, a blend of majors and minors? The, 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 the mix of work will change dramatically. Um, and I guess the answer is yes. And I question, you know, I'm getting better as we all do 
at things that we work at uh, for a period of time, you learn more. We're always learning. And uh, uh, with the many aspects to Act 250, major, minor, administrative, uh, the challenges with one of the criterias can all be different. Um, so uh, we, we uh, did you lose me or can you hear me? You can hear you, yeah. Okay. Uh, so uh, having people be on the board consistently for a period of time, I think is very important in, in terms of them handling uh, applications and doing the best job with them. And I think, um, I think this current system uh, that's being proposed would be a problem for that. Right. And recruiting people right. to serve. Right, right. Well, um, I'm looking around the room to see if there's, I don't see any yellow hands up. Anyone wanna wave at me, holler out? Uh, okay, well, um, thank you very much, Mr. Bazer. Great to hear uh, a report from the field. And with that, I'd like to go on to another district commissioner who's joined us this morning, uh, Mr. Taylor. Good morning. Uh, hello, folks. Um, thank you for this opportunity. Um, I'm Tim Taylor, and I'm the chair of District 3. And I've been doing this for about 10 years now, since 2011. Um, <clears throat> I know a few of you in the room. Um, I'm a farmer. Um, my wife and I have Crossroad Farm. We live in Thedford, Vermont, near Lake Fairley. And uh, <laughs> Chair Sheldon knows me, <laughs> and some of you in the house know me too. Um, so I, I've submitted something, and maybe I'll get through most of it, maybe I won't, but I just want you to know that Act 250 is probably the, one of the most significantly important things that's been in my life. Um, so I went to Vermont Law School before I farmed for 40 years. I'm still farming full time and I'm pushing 70 now. And um, when I graduated, I had the pleasure of be having my clerkship with none other than Jonathan Brownell and Norris Hoyt. And I could tell you some great stories about that, but we don't have time for that. Then I took up farming and um, we had a little 15 acres and Having been in law school, I really didn't know what the heck I was doing, as you can imagine, when we started this farm in 1980, the same time our child Mariah was born. So um, we uh, adjacent to us was 20 acres of some of the nicest farmland um, that you could ever want to grow on. And uh, a, a fellow by the name of George Huntington was proposing 10 two acre lots there. And of course that triggered Act 250 and lo and behold, the District 3 Act 250 Commission, which ironically I've chaired now for a while, decided Alice Flannery, Senator McCormick probably remembers her very well, I bet, um, was chairing at the time and said, no, no, you violated three out of the four um, 9B prime ag soil issues and they decided against it. He turned around, he was a smart man and sold us the land. And that became the cornerstone for our farm for the last 40 years, of which we fed the Upper Valley quite significantly. Um, and right after that, in the later 80s, uh, a proposal came for 56 houses right behind us. Uh, once again, Act 250 stepped in. They pushed the, they saved the 20 acres of farmland there and pushed the houses into the woods. And lo and behold, we have a conserved farm with Vermont Land Trust now, 56 acres. And um, we are one of the, um, I like to think of us as one of the, you know, uh, more important, uh, you know, we succeeded anyway. We're here in the Upper Valley doing our job. What I do want to point out to you folks in Bean District 3 is that I've, you know, I'm, I, we, our district covers Randolph, it covers little towns like Granville. So it covers Hartford, it covers Newberry. Um, we even go into Addison County way up on the mountain uh, to the Snow Bowl. Um, so I have a little experience. I've conducted about 70 of these hearings. And what I think you need to consider is, and you'll see this in my submittal, but when you look at this issue, this executive order, which is not very different from some of what was proposed last year, is this proposal in keeping with the Act 250 Commission? I mean, why did we have the commission for two years if now we're just simply going in another direction? 
has there been a history of this inconsistent decision making? And I'd like to point out there, and I might elaborate, that probably 70% of the uh, cases we've handled, the issue comes down to criteria eight, which if anyone knows, that's the aesthetic criteria. And that one has to do with the sensibilities, is it so offensive to the sensibilities of an average person as to re render it a, a violation of Act 250? And so that one allows for extremely particular circumstances in particular cases throughout the state. And there's different facts every time. And we've solved those problems by permitting almost every single one of them, however, with conditions. So it gets done. But the point is, it's an average person standard. This doesn't require experts. If we need experts under rulemaking, we can get experts. If we need legal help, we can get it. We did turn to the Natural Resources Board, and there they are, two attorneys that are very helpful to us. Um, another one, our issues that I mentioned the complex issue a little bit. Physical austerity, this will be extremely expensive. We work for 50 bucks a day right now. Um, and then do you, you know, this has been mentioned before, but I think it's the cornerstone to it. Do you want to reduce Dean Davis's core principle that Act 250 be decentralized and be accessible to Vermonters? Now, for me, for me, some of the most important things that happen in a hearing, and, and sometimes, let me just give you a quick rundown of how this works, generally speaking. My coordinator, Linda Matson, who's years and years of experience of this, will get an application. She will review it. She will send out an email to me. And in that, she will usually have a little bit of advice. She'll give me the link to the website that I go on to look at it and to the other two commissioners as well. She will make a suggestion as to whether the, she thinks it might be a major or minor. And you know, in these times, we're trying to make things as easy as we can. So we've been pushing out a lot of minors if we can do it. So we work really hard to make it a minor if we can. But remember, all it takes, so what'll happen is that comes in, if it's deemed complete, then we issue the permit right away within 30 days. Now, that permit goes out. When it goes out, it has the opportunity for the neighbors to respond or the state agencies to respond. If they request a hearing at that point, it goes to hearing. It has nothing to do with us, it goes to hearing. All they have to do is show a particularized interest. Okay, so we try to get the application complete. We try to get it in and review and make sure that all the boxes are checked so that this permit will stand up and will go out as a minor. Um, as you'll see in my statistics that I show from 2018, almost all of them went out as either administrative amendments or minors. There were very few hearings, I think something on the order of 35, of which only five of those were appealed to the environmental court. So really what problem are we discussing? This is a very, very stable law that has had very, in my time, in my 10 years, very little changes made to it. Um, the Quichi test still stands, as I've mentioned, for, uh, for criteria eight. And, um, but to wrap up, what is so important to me is when I conduct a hearing, I let folks know that I am not the state. Maybe I am the state, but I'm not. I'm a lay person. I'm just like them. If I were to come in to a comparable Act 250 hearing, I'd be coming in just like they do as a citizen. Um, and that as I conduct the hearing, I really direct myself to the questions that they have. And then what makes me the most satisfied is if at the end of that hearing, they come up to me and say, hey, thank you. I know you probably don't agree with me, but you listen to me. And that made my day, and that may, and thank you very much. That's what the process is largely about: is listening and hearing, being empathetic, being neighborly, being Vermont. That's the way I look at it. So, um, I could go on forever about it. So, I'll, <laughs> with that, I'll just pass it back to you all. Okay. Um, any questions for Mr. Taylor? Uh, Senator McCormick. Thanks. Uh, first of all, before a question, just a comment. Since I once had your job, uh, I have a particular proprietary sense about the District 3 Commission. And it sounds like, like not much has changed. 
And I want to also special point out when you mentioned your farm in Thetford, the importance of ag land in Thetford because of Thetford's location relative to the Connecticut River and relative to the Upper Valley. Um, there's not a lot of good farmland, not a lot of good bottom land in Eastern Vermont. It's not a coincidence that most of our farming is in the Northwest, which is the, the, the Champlain Valley. Um, that's precious land, it's important land. Also, the, the proximity of Thetford to Hanover, Hartford, Lebanon, the so-called Tritown area, which means it really is, it wants to become a bedroom community. And, and we're not gonna preserve that land through market forces. It's gonna be preserved through, through a little bit of social engineering. And uh, so thank you for your, thank you for your good work. And we'll get together someday and talk about Alice Flannery. <laughs> well, it's one quick comment, Senator McCormick. It's not without notice that I'm sitting next to a Sabre Field um, of the Upper Valley. <laughs> that's the Connecticut yeah. River. And uh, that's actually a collage, a study for 1999 Upper Valley. So um, she's one of my favorites. Yep. My dog ate her chickens in 1978. That's how we know. <laughs> There, there's so many ways to meet your neighbors in Vermont. <laughs> yes. <laughs> well, thank you um, for this opportunity. Okay. Um, well, I, I, it's interesting to hear you um, describe the law as intentionally decentralized. And uh, I've gone back and read the Addison Independent uh, archives for when the governor and Art Gibb presented on the bill in Middlebury back in 1970. And it's just interesting reading. And, and they acknowledge there'll be some pushback, uh, but that it was essential work that needed to get started. So um, I think it's never had a totally smooth road, but meaningful conversations between people are not always that easy to, to engage in. Um, I wanted to go back to something Mr. Uh, I mean, Ms. Smith brought up, and that was act, uh, local access. So if these meetings were moved to quote unquote, the professional board, I mean, at the current moment, everyone's virtually the same distance away from any meeting, but um, I'm, I'm imagining at some point we'll all be sitting at tables again together. And I'm just wondering the degree to which you think it would change the nature of the process to have to be at a, um, a professional board meeting as opposed to a, a local district commission meeting? Well, I think that's what I sort of indicated. Again, it does have to do with the personality of the individual chair largely and how they, how they comport themselves. But I think, I think the history is there and that, that being a lay person, you have a kind of empathy and you don't, you know, you don't ever get jaundiced in the same way that potentially a professional does. Um, I remember one time one of my, co my commissioners was texting on the phone while we were listening to testimony. And after that, I really talked to that person. I said, no, you need, if you're going to do this, you need to give your full attention to them. Um, this, that, that's very important. Um, so I think there would be a, a degree more of intimidation without that. Um, when I did, when we did exit four, if you remember Sam Samus wanting to do what would have been the largest project since Taft Flats, there were 160 plus people in the room, but I stood up and I went around the room and I directed myself to each individual and I had them introduce themselves. It took some time, but I think it was um, very important uh, to do that. And, and so um, I just don't see what, where the problem is. I really don't, especially when you see so few of these uh, going to appeal to the district, you know, to the environmental board. I think there are things to discuss about changing Act 250, maybe extending jurisdiction. Um, but um, but I, wouldn't, uh, I wouldn't be touching what we do as civilians, as lay people. I think we're doing a good job. Okay. Um, any questions for Mr. Taylor before we take a break here? Okay, so thank you to everyone who's here and participating. Um, we're gonna take a break till 10 o'clock, at which point the administration uh, will be joining us. 
Um, so we'll learn some more about the executive order. Uh, and uh, we, the streaming, the public YouTube streaming will continue throughout the break. So I suggest <laughs> that you mute and stop your video. Um, so you don't reveal more to the world than you intended on a break. Uh, okay. Well, let's do one thing for ourselves here while we're waiting for the uh, rest of the guests to assemble. Um, and I, I skipped over this on my own notes from this morning, which was to pause and just go around the room uh, because uh, it's a new session, committees have changed and we all haven't necessarily met each other. So I just thought we would just say uh, for everyone who's on the two committees uh, and so that the public listening in, we're all labeled these days on, on um, Zoom, but it's not quite the same as saying hello. So sorry for that oversight. I skipped my own uh, outline. And I'll ask to uh, just go through your committee alphabetically. And um, with that, I'll just jump in, starting with our own committee. So my name is Chris Bray, and I represent the Addison Senate District. This is a test of whether everyone knows where they are <laughs> in the alphabet. <laughs> so Brian? Be Senator Campion would be next. <laughs> and his Hollywood Square is black, so let's move on. Mark McDonald, um, Orange County. Um, Seth Bongards, first time, the first sighting I've seen you since we served in the house long ago. I'm Dick long ago. Yes, I'm. I'm Dick McCormick, former chair of the District Three Environmental Commission. Senator Westman. I'm um, Rich Westman. I'm the senator from Memorial. Uh, senator Bray, I'm, I'm back. I apologize. Uh, <laughs> yeah. I'm, uh, you just need to say who you are, where you're from. Please. Yes, no, I understand that. Uh, senator Campion, Bennington County in Wilmington. Uh, always great to be with the House, especially Chair Sheldon and Representative Bongartz. Uh, and wonderful to see uh, uh, former Senator uh, Diane Snelling joining us. All right, so how about the House team there? We've never tried to do alphabetical, but I think we should give it a, um, the old yeah. college try. Yeah. Well, <laughs> we set the bar a little bit low there, so <laughs> take a whack at it. Yeah. Um, I think that puts Nelson Brownell. Uh, representing Pamela and Warford from Bennington One. Seth Bongartz, um, representing Bennington Four, Arlington, Manchester, Sandgate, and Sunderland, or almost all of Sunderland. Share a little bit of it with, with Representative Durfee. And my district's not, mate, Kathleen James, but Seth Bongartz. <laughs> and, um, not sure if uh, Representative Dolan's with us. She's also was headed to House Appropriations. I am here. All right. Uh, Representative Dolan from Washington 7 <coughs> District, which, which includes Faceton, Duxbury, Moortown, Whitfield, and Warren. Thank you. All right, it gets more confusing. Um, Paul, I think you're up. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I was confused. Um, Paul LaFay from Newark. I represent Six towns in Northern Essex <clears throat> County, one town in Orleans County, and one town in Caledonia County, which is my own. Thank you. Representative Morgan. Excuse me. Good morning. I'm <laughs> Leland Morgan. I represent all of Grand Isle County and the western portion of Milton. Okay, I think that completes our, no? Is that no, completed? No, doesn't, we're not even, no. uh, we have Representative Mor uh, Morris, are you in the room? I am, thank you very much, Madam Chair. <clears throat> uh, Christy Morris, representing the large town of Springfield. Um, I'll, 
I don't know if Harvey Smith, I think he might have left. Um, Amy Sheldon, I represent Middlebury. And, and I'm here. Larry Satkowitz, I represent Orange Washington Addison District. Oh, thanks. Sorry, sorry Larry. That's all um, right. And um, Representative Terenzini may have left also. Okay. All right. Well, I, I don't see any other squares to uncover here. So thank you, everyone. And uh, we're going to re recommence. Um, so uh, welcome to uh, uh, Secretary Moore, I see, Commissioner Porter, uh, Ms. Johnson, uh, and I don't know if you have anyone else with you, and I'm not seeing them on the screen here. Okay. So just so you'll know where we've been so far this morning, we did two things. We uh, started with our own ledge council. We looked, and we've been looking at the bill from the EO, excuse me, from two perspectives. One, uh, in terms of the content, what's the idea here and what are its merits? Uh, we've had a little feedback from some district commissioners. And um, the other thing that uh, Ledge Council uh, helped us take a look at is the legal uh, structure of the bill. So for instance, not to be too opaque about this, for instance, the provision that uh, the EO outlines for having uh, a rejection, should it not be approved that both House and Senate must disapprove. Um, so we're doing both. And I thought maybe we would follow the same path we started this morning, which was start with the content. You know, what's the idea? Uh, why'd you bring the bill forward? I always figure any, uh, again, I said bill, EO. Um, you know, when we start any bill in committee, we always start with the same two questions. What opportunity or problem do you see and how does the proposal you're making uh, address uh, one or both? So with that, Secretary Moore, uh, I'll ask you to run your team and feel free to move back and forth, call on each, defer to each other, et cetera. So thanks for coming. You're welcome, Senator. Thank, thank you for having me this morning. Um, I will keep my remarks rather brief, but I'm also happy to ask or answer questions uh, folks might have once I complete them about the content. I think it, at, its, at its most basic, um, the proposal is, is getting at the, the fact that, that Act 250 currently isn't um, well positioned necessarily to grow and evolve and remain relevant in a world that is increasingly complicated and, and frankly litigious. Um, and there are challenges associated with the decentralized model of district commissions and the um, really uh, important, robust and technical, deeply technical uh, issues that at times are, are coming before the commissions. And so the, the proposal to professionalize um, the, the Natural Resources Board and create full-time staff positions for reviewing major applications. And those are the applications where those most complicated issues tend to arise, uh, would allow for board members to develop experience and expertise, um, drawing from, from the, the talent within the Agency of Natural Resources and other parts of state government, um, to, but to really serve that role uh, that Act 250 plays in, in protecting Vermont's natural resources. Uh, I would add that, that um, I, I think it's important to, or I, I would guess I would not want it to go without saying um, that, that we are committed uh, to the, the protection of natural resources. This isn't an, an, ever, an effort uh, frankly, to, to undermine the protections afforded by Act 250 and the important uh, regulatory tool that it is, but rather really this reflection of the increasingly complex world that we're operating in um, and that a model that is, has served us very well for 50 years um, is not particularly well positioned necessarily to serve us well into the future. Uh, and maybe just pause there with an, an opportunity if folks have specific questions about the content I'm, I'm happy to take them up but thought it was important to start with that kind of framing sure uh thank you i'm looking around to see if i don't see any hands at the moment okay 
Uh, Senator Campion. Madam Secretary, good to see you. Nice to see you too. I don't know if you were on uh, prior to now listening at all to some of you weren't. Okay. Yeah. So there has, uh, there's great, con significant concern about taking this away uh, hey, from, 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 I'm sorry, is Senator Bray, is that your phone? No, uh, not me. Okay. Uh, taking this away from local control isn't really quite the way I want to say it, but folks that know their communities, communities differ uh, even, you know, from miles away from one another. So could you say something about that and, and why you moved in that direction? Yeah, well, and, and I think it's important to acknowledge that, that that was a, we had a lot of discussion around that in the House Natural Resources Committee mm -hmm. um, during the last biennium when we initially had, had brought forward this proposal as part of a larger Act 250 modernization package. Um, and the, the discussion in that committee is reflected in the EO in that the, the proposal in front of you uh, has those three permanent um, or, or full-time board members augmented by two representatives of the local district. Uh, the intention there is, is to provide that, that consistency um, while at the same time making sure that, that local concerns and issues have a, a voice at the table and in the process. And we think that that strikes an, an important balance um, between sort of uh, allowing people to, to um, accrue the depth of knowledge needed to take on some of these more complicated tasks balanced against uh, the, the perspective of, of folks who, who live in the area on the ground and can, can anticipate the impacts it could have for their communities. Thank you for that. And just may I, Mr. Chair, a uh, follow yes, up? Please. I'm just for my own clarification, Secretary Moore, are those uh, individuals, are they in the decision making uh, camp? In other words, can they, are they making decisions, those local representatives, or are they similar to what one might consider to be a, a witness, you know? coming in, talking, and, and informing those that are actually going to make the decisions? Uh, they, they would be participating with the, the board in the conversation. Mm -hmm. I, I would actually need to defer to Jay. I apologize in that I don't remember if, if we, we had talked both about having them have a voting role or an advisory role, and I, I can't remember where that landed. My apologies. That's okay. Is it okay if Ms. Johnson responds to that? Uh, yes, yes, please. Uh, it's it is clear, it's contemplated that they have a voting role on the issue um, which is affecting their district. Okay. okay. So may I just take that? Uh, so if if a committee if a community is sending two representatives, um, and is it two representatives from each town, or or, or is it it's more geographic? Is it sort of like it's drawn from the, the district sort of, commission? Oh, from the district right from the district commission. So uh, Ms. Johnson, you're saying that those, during a particular case, those two individuals would vote, have, it would be really a vote of five instead of three. That's correct. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Senator McDonald. Um, I, it was just stated that the, the district commission would send two people. Uh, I believe my understanding was that the uh, the, the board above would select two people, which is it? The district commissioner, the, the chair of the district commission chooses two commissioners to sit with the natural resources board on the issue. Not the natural resources board selecting the two. No. Thank you. Okay. Um, you know, we've had, we've, uh, talked with you a lot over the years about Act 250. And um, there sometimes it's a challenging area of law to talk about because um, there are a lot of different impressions of what's going on. And um, so it would be helpful, I think, for the committees to hear about, uh, you mentioned, for instance, consistency. And I think that's one of the things I've heard uh, mentioned quite a few times. And there's a tension between consistency and uh, local decision making that reflects the local, uh, the uh, you might say the personality of the district and the inhabitants of that district as they review a permit. Um, and 
So I'm wondering about on the consistency side, what particular problems are you seeing that make you, uh, you know, what have you seen specifically that makes you conclude that there is a problem that merits being addressed out there? Sure, I, I can start with a, a, a state agency example actually drawn from VTRANS, but then may turn it over to, to Lewis and he can speak to it, perhaps some more specific examples from his department. Um, but uh, the example from VTRANS is regarding the application of the, the 10 acre threshold to, to um, pre-existing development. As you may be aware, uh, different bridge and exit replacement projects at times ex exceed that threshold. Um, and there have been differing opinions as to, to when VTRANS uh, needs to seek an Act 250 um, permit, depending on the, the jurisdictional opinion issued in that particular, um, by that particular district commission. Uh, I think most recently there were concerns around the, the project they're pursuing at exit 17 off of I-89, um, but this is something that has come up for them before um, and is maybe the, the easiest example to, to point to about the types of concerns that, that come up. I don't know, Lewis, if there's anything you would, you would add. The, the only thing I'd add is a general comment, which is <laughs> I think that the chair is right it's a balance between wanting local voice, local information, local feelings, uh, and a statewide consistent approach to cases and what cases are judged on and how they're judged. And I think that's exactly why the EO is structured as it is to include both of those elements. So you will have a uh, consistent application from the, from the full-time uh, board members, and you will also have input from those who know the local area and community best. Um, what we see now is, is uh, uh, quite, quite significant differences at times across the commissions, uh, understandably so because they are all from those regional uh, or local areas and they, uh, and they are uh, informed by past cases that they work on. Um, and you're mentioning past cases. So can you say, this may be a question more from Ms. Johnson, I don't know the degree or also the NRV is here with us uh, this morning, the degree to which an opinion issued by a, a district commission like a JO um, has a, you know, precedential power or influence over future decisions. Can they, you know, to, to some degree, must they all be quote unquote consistent or, or is there an allowable degree of variation that reflects uh, the facts on the ground, because literally every application is unique in some ways. You know? I think, uh, Chair, that is a question probably best put to the, the NRB and either Chair Snelling or uh, Greg Bobel, her attorney. Okay, so we'll hold on to that one. And Mr. Bobel, if you can help me not forget to come back to that, that would be helpful, thanks. Sure. Um, uh, you know, so I'll just, bring forward something that some of the district commissioners who are in here shared with us. And that was that on the question of technical expertise that they felt as though they were well enough resourced that however complex the application became, that they could draw on a &R assistance um, and other experts in order to come up to speed on the issues in front of them. Um, so do you have you know, a response, I'm not trying to debate, I'm just trying to bring forward things we've already heard this morning. Do you have uh, any thoughts on that? Yeah, and, and I think that that is both the, the opportunity and the challenge. Um, I, we have compiled the number of hours ANR staff spend um, participating in Act 250 on average each year. Um, and it works out to be about three quarters of a million dollars worth of staff time. Um, and part of that is because it, it is a, a more significant lift um, working with nine different district commissions, um, the, the rotating memberships of those commissions to provide that uh, technical assistance and education. Uh, Lewis can certainly speak to that in more detail, um, but that, that's one of our, our most significant concerns is that it is a, a really significant demand on agency staff time um, and to the extent we're, we're working with a, a smaller group, 
that can build expertise over time, uh, we are anticipating uh, that that will reduce the demands on our staff time. Um, and, th and that is significant in this area or this um, time of, of constrained and finite resources. I don't know, Lewis, if there's anything you'd add there. Yes, thank you, Secretary Moore. I, I uh, second everything you said uh, for the Fish and Wildlife Department, it's give or take $300,000 a year on Act 250, uh, depending on the number of projects. Uh, we do not receive funding for that uh, from the applicants, from the developers. We pay for that essentially from funds we get from uh, hunters, anglers, and trappers, um, e or from recreational shooters through uh, federal aid money. But I, I would like to go back briefly, because I, I did have the opportunity and advantage of hearing your, your prior testimony. And uh, I think that your, your, uh, your, the, the folks you had from the district commissions, who I have a tremendous amount of respect personally and for the work they do uh, on behalf of their communities in the state, uh, made an interesting point. Uh, I think it was Fred Bazer said, well, we have access to the district coordinators and we have access to the experts from the applicants and we have expert, we have access to the uh, to the state agencies, all of which is true, all of which is an important part of the process. But I would just suggest to you that some additional uh, expertise and experience and knowledge among those making the decisions would help uh, help those decisions not be as subject to the direction of any of those groups that I just mentioned. All of those groups have important input to the process, important expertise that they do and should bring to bear. Uh, but I do think that a, a, what is, what is uh, a volunteer uh, board of, of citizens uh, can be uh, subject to, to the expert opinions that come before them and would uh, be benefit from greater experience, knowledge, and longevity on making those decisions and gaining knowledge themselves. I don't know if that makes sense, Mr. Chair, if I'm getting my point across, but I, I think that when you hear the list of people who are relied on, all good people, but all who have their own perspective and their own interests in the case. Thank you. Okay. Um, you and the secretary have mentioned the cost related aspects and we're sensitive to that. Um, as a matter of fact, we've had a discussion last year and already started one this year, uh, getting ready for this session about finding funding for fish and wildlife so that you're remunerated for your efforts in supporting Act 250 applications like the environmental impact assessment work you have to do. So we're certainly uh, don't, we're cognizant that we, people basically, we need to pay for the services we're expecting for government and we should, uh, you shouldn't just have to stretch your budget further and further every year. Um, that said, have, you analyze, uh, maybe it's a, a Madam Secretary question, uh, the relative costs of providing technical expertise out to the nine DCs uh, versus uh, building more centralized expertise on a, a, a board with full-time professional staffing. Uh, at this point, Chair, we, we haven't taken our analysis to that level. We, we went through the, the work of, of trying to come up with a realistic estimate across the agency of, of staff time spent on, on reviewing and participating in Act 250 proceedings, um, but haven't yet forecast uh, what the, the reduction in, in those demands was, is anticipated to be as a result of a centralized structure. I'm, I'm happy to take that analysis to the next level, just recognizing it would be a, a, a bit of a swag. I, I would only add to that, Mr. Chair, if I could, that uh, it goes beyond the scope of an EO or a, a governor's executive order authority, but we are interested in, in having a discussion with these two committees and others in the legislature about those services, how they're paid, uh, whether there's a more efficient and better way to provide those services and so on. So we're, it's not that we're ignoring that part of the conversation, just it goes beyond the scope of an EO. Thank you. Sure, Senator Campion, uh, uh, and and then sorry, I, I see some now. I do see other hands up, so I'll I'll keep going. Secretary Moore, uh, do you anticipate uh, the administration putting forward a fee bill this year? Uh, I no, I I don't. Not not that implicates ANR fees at this point in time. Although, um, as Commissioner Porter indicated, we do anticipate a. Uh, um, 
that there will be a, a larger uh, Act 250 modernization proposal that the administration supports that will be introduced. Um, and that does include uh, the, the wildlife permit component of it, um, which is, is one of the mechanisms we're looking at in terms of, of providing financial support um, to the department for their engagement in Act 250. Um, but in terms of a, a, a specific fee bill, um, we are not anticipating that this year. If I if I may add to that briefly, and, and I apologize for the, for the tag team here. If it gets too much, just let me know. Um, a, a fish and wildlife fee bill would not do much to answer the, the concern that I have here because our fees are levied on hunters, anglers, and trappers. My concern is that we are providing a service that benefits both uh, certainly the resource but also uh, project applicants and project opponents uh, for which it, there is not a funding mechanism put into place. So a fee bill would not would not address that, uh, Senator Campion. Thank you. No, I appreciate that. Yeah, that wasn't, I was just curious in, in general with regard to a fee bill. I mean, this isn't, you know, we're, we're hearing that across the state agencies are stretched. And um, so it was just a general question. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, so, uh, uh, next up will be Chair Sheldon, then Senator McCormick, Representative <clears throat> Dolan, and Representative Lefebvre. Sorry if that's not the order in which you raised your hands, but I see four hands up now, so we'll go right down the line. Thank uh, you. Thanks, Chair Bray. Um, since we're talking about money, um, I'm hoping the agency can, you told us how much you spend on ANR or on Act 250 permits a year. How much do you receive from Act 250 fees every year? Uh, I will let Lewis correct me if I'm wrong because he's been a little bit more in the details, but it, it's on the order of, but I believe, two hundred thousand dollars a year. Okay, thanks. And then, um, how much would the new professional board cost, and how are you proposing to pay for that? So that that is a, a good question. We've really focused in in thinking about the cost on the cost of making the the transition. Um, I think in, in making this transition, there, there are probably some, some larger opportunities for, for um, looking at, at the structure of, of the NRB overall and thinking that through, um, but we haven't gone to those steps beyond just uh, affecting the transition. We anticipate, uh, however, that in the, the first year, and I, I believe this information was presented in your committee last year, Chair Sheldon, and we haven't revised it since then, um, that we anticipate it, it would take um, between five and six hundred thousand dollars to to make that transition. Uh, and and was, where, can I just? Oh, oh sorry. Did you know? Have you identified a source for that money? Uh, I I don't want to get out in front of the governor in presenting his budget, um, but I am anticipating it would take the form of a one-time allocation. Thank you. Okay. Uh, anything more, Representative Sheldon? No, thanks. Okay. Uh, Senator McCormick. Thanks. Um, over the years, uh, some, someone said earlier that this is sort of like Groundhog Day. It's, it's not only the, the constant complaints about Act 50, but it's always the same complaints. And they're the ones that were predicted by Dean Davis himself. Uh, and one of them that, that I've heard is... Uh, something referred to as, quote, you guys in Montpelier. <clears throat> and it's that you guys in Montpelier don't trust local communities and that there's too much top down from you guys in Montpelier. And, and uh, I'm, I've got to say, it, it's very surprising that we would take power away from the community and, 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 um, and, and concentrate it up with you guys in Montpelier, but the, the other thing I want to say, having having um, uh, been having chaired a district commission, uh, is that the expertise issue matters. It's a quasi judicial board. The chair is a quasi judge, but not a. I think these days the chair is usually law trained. I was not law trained when I chaired the commission, but I got to tell you, I spent a lot of time on the phone to Montpelier and got guidance from uh, the council to the, to the state uh, and then environmental board. Uh, but you also, the, the, that there, you don't have to be an expert yourself to have the intelligence and, and capacity for attention 
to take expert testimony and understand it and ask the questions necessary when, when you don't. So I guess I, I, if I have a, a question, I, that was a speech and I apologize. For my question is this, you, are you said that the Act 250 is not well positioned to um, deal with uh, current development issues. And I'm wondering if you could go into a little more detail. What is the problem uh, that if we have too much local control, what is, what is the problem with local control that this is intended to fix? Sure, uh, and I apologize, Senator. I may have not been as, as clear as I could have been in my, my remarks. Really, our, our focus is on, on looking at the, the interest the General Assembly has expressed um, in, in new criteria, um, sort of reflecting the larger evolution of our regulatory landscape. Um, there are places now that, that ANR has permitting and regulatory authority that certainly didn't exist when Act 250 came into being. Um, and there are places that clearly are in, important to our environmental goals moving forward. Uh, the, obviously, the body spent a long time last session um, discussing a forest fragmentation criteria. I know that in House Natural, there was also discussion around a climate change criteria. And really what I, I was endeavoring to reflect is to the extent we're going to take on um, new areas within Act 250 that are technically complex um, and will require a, a significant sort of startup um, relative to their administration, I think that this sort of um, reformed board structure would serve us exceedingly well and create the capacity uh, for Act 250 to, to take on these next generation challenges. It's less a reflection of, of current conditions on the ground, although there is a piece of that, and more, frankly, uh, forward looking at, at what uh, my understanding has been this body's uh, interest is, as well as my own agency's interest in, in the role Act 250 can play going, uh, going forward. Okay, I'm, uh, Mr. Chairman, I'm still not sure what the problem is we're being asked to fix with this uh, executive order, but we have time. We have 90 days, so. So thank going you. down, thank you. Going down the line, uh, Representative Dolan. Thank you and good morning. Good to see you again today. Yes. <laughs> uh, my question, uh, um, and, and thank you for coming in to help explain the nuances of this executive order. My question is about cost. Uh, when, when, um, when we think about public participation at the local level, that is all about accessibility of the process by the public to weigh in on important matters that are affecting their livelihood, their communities. And, uh, and so that cost for public participation matters. Uh, when, you, when we centralize it, I presume it may end up resulting in increasing the cost of an individual wishing to participate in a process such as Act 250 proceedings. Um, and I think what, what this um, proposal somewhat looks like is a public utility commission that is able to manage some of those costs with a whole department to represent the public interest. The public advocate is the Department of Public Service with the quasi-judicial board being a centralized board to, to hear testimony. So I guess my question is, uh, and, and yet that, that is um, because of the legal nature of those proceedings, it ends up requiring legal support to, uh, to shepherd forward proposals in front of the Public Utility Commission. So um, have you evaluated some of these costs that, um, that may be borne by the, you know, the citizens of Vermont or the re or residents of Vermont for uh, participating in Act 250 proceedings? Um, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't say we, we've done that specifically or explicitly, but I, I do think it's important to, to keep that, that um, to state up front that the intention is, is not to modify the, the opportunities for, for public participation, appreciating very much sort of the, the look and feel of Act 250. Um, and that it, it does allow for uh, concerned neighbors and local residents to have a platform to, to raise issues and concerns and voice opinions. 
Uh, there, there's no intention to, to move away from that. And I think uh, there, there are ways to be cognizant of those needs, including having hearings take place in, in the, the district uh, where the application hailed from um, that will continue to be important tools as we move forward. If I might just add briefly to that, uh, th this proposal would add capacity to the NRB. Um, the, the current capacity that exists would remain and it would add capacity at least in the form of uh, three professional full-time uh, uh, board members who would do work um, in addition to the current to the current staff at, at NRB, as, as I read it anyway. So I think that that would uh, would provide additional ability to manage that at, uh, from what exists now in the. Uh, and Representative Lafave, thank you for waiting so patiently. Uh, thank you. You're welcome. Um, my question for the commissioner, um, he mentioned that uh, his department spends about $300,000 a year. Is that on both major and minor projects, commissioner? That is across our Act 250 work. And, and that's a variable number um, based on the number of projects and the complexity of, of projects. But yes, it's across our Act 250 work. Uh, in general, uh, the, the vast majority is on major projects. Um, the, the minors are relatively quick. And am I uh, it, am I correct in assuming that that's the kind of work you do to determine if a project will have an impact on a habitat or or a wildlife corridor or something along those lines? Well, wildlife corridors are not uh, really covered by Act Two Hundred and Fifty currently, but yes, we we that's the. That's the review and, and study we do of, of projects impact on things like bear habitat, deer wintering yards, riparian areas, things like that. And presently you do not have uh, build back authority as far as the, uh, uh, the project developer is concerned, you cannot build back the work you do. So that's a little bit of a complicated question. Uh, there is a statute authorizing ANR build back on this kind of work, but the reality is that the administrative and legal confines on that are so strict, uh, it renders it basically unusable. And, and I'm happy to go into that in more detail at some other point if you'd like, or, or now if you'd like, but essentially the sideboards on that and the, and the difficulty of administering it are very strict, thank you. Uh, my last question is to just follow up with, with how would that change then? How would, uh, how, would change, how would the change from district commissions to a professional board impact the, uh, the amount of money that the department is spending to do this kind of work? Well, it would change directly because of this EO and the, and the change in structure in one way, which is that we would gain uh, the ability to work in a longer term and, and narrower way with with a smaller number of folks to, to develop expertise and experience and knowledge. Uh, right now we spend a, a, quite a bit of time uh, uh, in working with district commissions uh, all over the state who due to the workload frequently turn over uh, and we have a, uh, we sort of rolling a rock uphill in terms of, of that work. We're happy to do it because it's an investment in the process an investment in the district commissions, but it does, uh, it does take a tremendous amount of our work. Uh, so that would, uh, the professionalization, the added expertise and longevity would help in that area. But I will say that this executive order does not uh, Im impose a fee or a change in bill back that would allow us to recoup funds directly. We do uh, contemplate having that conversation or would like to have that conversation with the legislature in, in the legislative process that goes beyond the scope of an EO. Thank you, Representative Lafave. Anything more? Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Okay. Um, any other questions focused more on the uh, the content side of the executive order at this point? Okay. Um, so then I'd like to uh, change uh, gears a little bit and uh, refer uh, everyone back to um, probably the most useful 
thing to take a look at again to remind yourself is the memo that uh, Mr. Martland uh, wrote at the request of the uh, President Pro Tem on the legal status of the executive order. And um, so I'll boil it down to uh, two questions and I guess I'll address them to Ms. Johnson and then others, of course, if you have questions you wanna chip in, let's, uh, I'll keep an eye out for hands. So um, Ms. Johnson, thank you for coming. Uh, I guess the, the simplest question is, um, as we were informed by our council, the, the terms of the executive order require both house and Senate to, uh, should they not uh, wanna approve of the executive order, that both bodies must disapprove of the executive order. Um, and the underlying statute talks about a either uh, body disapproving is sufficient. And, and then they pointed out the legislative history where previous EOs by this administration didn't include this must be rejected twice sort of language. And it wasn't uh, challenged by the administration previously. So I'm just wondering if you could explain the thinking behind uh, changing the test that is offered uh, in the language. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, Jay Pershing Johnson, Governor's Legal Counsel. I, um, so, so that the difference essentially is to put, I think, the, to, to give the legislature notice. The last time we saw reorganization was in 2017, uh, in the first few days of the administration. Um, so we, so we, we, we did not challenge the, the, the existing structure. We were proceeding um, as set out in the statute. In the intervening period, we um, have done a lot more research on separation of powers and bicameral action. And there's a very, there's a leading case in the US Supreme Court, INS v. Chata, which you probably are aware of, which is very clear about uh, the constitutionality of a one house veto. Um, so I think in this executive order, we wanted to, to be clear that we were putting the um, General Assembly on notice that that was our position. Um, that said, you may have, and I haven't seen Mr. Martland's memo. There's also a memo from 2017 from Mike O'Grady to Representative Olson on this exact same issue where um, Mr. O'Grady goes into the, the various legal arguments that one might take on this issue. Um, and I've sent that to Jude if the committees are interested. Um, but you might have also heard that yesterday a suit was filed challenging the executive order as well um, on several grounds. But one of the issues is the, the constitutionality of the statutory structure in its entirety. I um, so um, while we believe our position is strong, um, uh, we also understand that reasonable lawyers can take different views of the law. And since this has been thrown into the court, um, it's our position we'd like to see the courts decide on the legal issues. Uh, we understand that, or we're hoping that they understand the, um, the timing constraints and would act quickly. And um, we would like to see the committees continue to work on the merits of the proposal and let the courts uh, make a determination on the legal issues. Okay. Uh, Senator Campion. So by the legal issues, uh, you're talking specifically about whether or not both House and Senate need to reject in order for this to be rejected. Um, from my perspective, that's the issue raised by legislative council. Um, there are other legal issues raised in the, the complaint in the lawsuit. Can, and are you, uh, just for clarity, are you saying that uh, Ledge Council is, my words, uh, mistaken that this just needs to be rejected by one of the two bodies in order for it not to go into effect? Uh, I would say that if you look at uh, Mike O'Grady's memo, you will see that there are two valid positions. I would say that I'm on one side and probably um, Attorney Martland is on the other. Um, but I think it's important to maybe 
understand the two issues by looking at that 2017 memo. What is uh, in addition, I think that the court when if the court gets to the the um, the merits of the complaint would be addressing the statutory structure of the um, or the constitutionality of the statutory structure. What does statute say now about this? I mean, I appreciate that there might be debate discussion true with a lot of things that we all do. What does statute say now? Statute says now that one house must disapprove. Oh, okay. That's okay. So that's that's what we should be operating on. I would, I would say. Sure. I mean, things could change. Absolutely. I mean, lawsuits could happen, debate could take place. But uh, okay, thank you. Sure. I mean, I just would like to point out that since that law was enacted, there is U.S. Supreme Court case law on the constitutionality of a one-house veto. And so we'll have to look into that further. Um, I guess what becomes a little complicated here is to use the statute whose constitutionality is being challenged or and which you're sort of asserting like uh, the case at the INSV Chata is to use that same um, statute in order to bring the EO to the legislature at all. So if it's unconstitutional, I don't, I'm wondering if it's a constitutional vehicle for even bringing an executive order to the legislature. Quite honestly, I think the law in total, section 2001 mm -hmm. and section 2002 of title three are very clear that the governor can bring this executive order for restructuring of the executive branch to the legislature. Further, the constitution provides for a process bicameral and presentment process um, pursuant to which all legislation is enacted. Um, I don't believe that the law fails in its entirety because of this flaw. Okay. Um, well, we have more to look into it. Mean, I mean, I'm comparing that with a bill, right? So a bill is offered, a bill goes through, it has to be approved, not disapproved by the two bodies and then presented to the governor. So it seems as though with this 90 day clock running and a power only to disapprove that uh, it puts the legislature into a very different posture than bringing forth a bill that then may be vetoed. Uh, so we'll have more to learn on, on that one. Um, any other questions on that, the test for whether it's approved or disapproved? Uh, Senator McCormick. Yeah, thanks. I, I wanna make a comment about the, the uh, the one house veto, uh, I and, and and invite a response. Uh, I guess that would be a question then. Uh, the phrasing of an override vote is not shall the uh, the veto be sustained. The question is shall the bill pass the veto notwithstanding. And so if either house decides not to do that, then you don't have two houses voting to pass the bill. So it does not advance. That is actually, uh, it seems to me what's operating there is the requirement of two houses. And if, if one house votes not to pass the bill, the governor's veto notwithstanding, then in fact, what has happened is you have not gotten your, your two houses. Uh, the second co comment I wanted to make, and again, in, in, invite a response, is uh, I have on numerous occasions voted for a bill that I knew full well some people thought was unconstitutional, but I have never voted for a bill that I thought was unconstitutional. The argument, well, let the courts decide, is when you say let the courts decide, if you think the bill is constitutional, let the courts decide is what you say to someone who insists that it's not. And, and, and who says, you can't vote for this because I think it's unconstitutional. And I said, well, the courts will have to decide that. Um, the, perhaps you would vote for an unconstitutional bill to create a test case. But uh, uh, otherwise, I think we are, we are bound not to pass a bill if, if we think it's unconstitutional. So my understanding is that, in fact, the statute that allows for a one house a veto of the governor's executive order. I'm using the word veto incorrectly. The one for the, the last one, one house to to reject uh, an 
executive order in this case. I, I think that may in fact be unconstitutional and, and I, I'd be reluctant to operate under, under that, uh, that provision. And I welcome a, a response. Um, I, uh, I guess Johnson, I'm, not, anything? I'm not entirely clear what the question is. Okay, um, how, how do you address the fact that the Vermont Constitution says you have to have both houses? Well, there are that, two provisions. That's a simple. Well, there are two provisions. One is presentment and bicam bicameral action presentment in order to enact a law. The governor's veto and one house action is contemplated in the Constitution. This, as actually even Senator Bray has corrected himself several times, is not a bill. This is a structure that the legislature itself has constructed. What I'm saying is I don't believe it's as constructed is constitutional. Attorney Martland clearly disagrees when we have two branches of government with different positions on the law, it seems to me prudent to let the third branch decide. Um. Well, we only have 90 days. <laughs> we only have 90 days. We have to take some kind of action or not. Within and, 90 and days. Decide which, yeah. And we have I some time, and you have some time to consider the proposal on the merits. Right. Um, separate question. And, sorry, Senator McDonald. No, that's not just saying this. That's a separate question. Um, has the administration proposed any new language around it? I mean, it seems as though uh, uh, what you're asserting is that there's a flaw in the underlying statute. It's unconstitutional. Uh, and do you have language to address that flaw in statute that would pave the way for this or, well, future EOs not to run into this controversy? I personally do not have a proposal for, con yeah. for a statutory change. Right. Okay. Um, all right. So, uh, any other questions on on that? Um, the other area that came up, and it was uh, a quote unquote gray area, was the extent to which the underlying statute contemplates, you know, changes as substantive as what's proposed in outline form in this executive order. Do you have any thoughts on that? The question is whether these changes are too substantive? Correct, rather than reorganization uh, that it will end up changing uh, statute to uh, create a new board, uh, move powers that currently reside with a district commission, for instance, to the new board, uh, take powers away from existing statutorily empowered district commissions, and then the rules, policies, procedures all follow with it. So it's, it's, more than, uh, reor it's more than an org chart change. It's going to have changes throughout statute law policy program. Uh, um, I believe that Section 202 authorizes the governor in this instance to make changes that are contrary to statute. Uh, it expressly contemplates that. Right. Sure, right. Uh, and uh, okay, so I'll, I'll leave it there. I mean, the, I'm not in a position to. Um, get into a legal debate over the extent of the change. The question that has come up was how much change is permissible um, before it is changing policy and things in the purview of the, the uh, legislature. I guess the other way I've heard that expressed is this, is, uh, this statute may, if it's interpreted as giving powers that broad to the executive, to write new law, in essence, uh, it may be over delegation to another branch, right? Well, it sounds as though you may have read the complaint. Um, I would say that since that's being litigated, um, I would want the courts, I think, to, to weigh in on that. 
Um, I would like to point out that as a matter of say the emergency powers, um, which sort of raises the same issue, there is a provision in chapter one of the constitution regarding the authority of the legislature to suspend the laws. Um, only the legislature can suspend the laws unless it provides authority to others to do so. Um, Section 202 clearly has done that. Okay. And, and you've done that as well in um, Title 20 with respect to emergency powers. Okay. Um, Both parties. Yeah. I'm not seeing any more hands on, the, on these questions. Senator McDonald. So uh, the question that we're contemplating is whether we take this or leave it. Is that correct? Is that a question for me? For anybody. Oh, that's the choice that's given in the law. It's up or down. Oh, thank you. Good enough for me. Okay. All right. Um, anything else members of the uh, administrative team would like to share with us before we move on. Okay. Thank you for, I don't know if you'll be able to stick with us or some of you. Uh, thank you for coming over and helping us keep the conversation going. As a reminder to everyone, this is day one. We're really doing a pretty rapid uh, scan of the landscape and we'll come back to more particular questions um, in days ahead. With that, I'd like to turn to uh, uh, the Natural Resources Board members. And so I see Chair Snelling and uh, Mr. Bobo. Um, so good morning and thank you for joining us. Um, you've, uh, you, I, I would wanna welcome any kind of remarks you have about the executive order and, and in response to the discussion you've heard. And Chair Snelling, I saw your hand going up a while ago at some point of- Not important. Past. Okay. So uh, please go ahead and uh, we'd like to hear your thoughts on the proposal uh, in the executive order. Thank you. And uh, it's great to be here today. I'm Diane Snelling and chair of, this, of the Natural Resources Board in Act 250. And really what I wanna to say today is a direct uh, response to my experience for the almost five years that I've served as chair of the Natural Resources Board. I keep hearing reference to three new uh, members of the board. And I just wanna remind you that I'm the chair now and there would be a chair in this, in this proposal. So it's really two new members. Um, and I think that when you think about it that way, you can see a, a very obvious balance between the, um, the board members uh, and the local. So, so to me, the option of that or the, the advantage of that is really gaining um, a broader experience um, with which to make these important decisions. So I, I do support the idea of a, of a full-time board and um, I want at the same time to say that our current board of volunteers is um, very engaged and yet it's practically impossible to give them sufficient information in a meeting once a month or even as often as they might be able to meet that really allows for a, a deeply informed and engaged conversation about the issues that we encounter every single day at the NRB. So I just wanted you to think about it is what facilitates the goals and purpose uh, of uh, the NRB and Act 250 better than a stronger board to, to work through those um, questions. And um, I guess we'll just leave it at that. So just to make sure that um, I understand and others, the current board structure, your full-time employee as uh, of the state and your chair of that three member board, correct? No, and then curr currently, I'm sorry, uh, Senator, currently there's a chair myself who's a full-time member and four volunteer members who are paid per diem to meet. And we have been meeting once a month um, and sharing, as I say, as much as we can, um, but it's very difficult in a limited time frame to become as informed as you all well know 
about the right. complexity of the issues in front of us. Sure. And the four volunteers, are they, are they paid the same per diem like the members of the district commission? $50, that that? yeah, whatever. Yeah. Yeah. Yep, okay. And what business, I mean, are you, I just want to make sure we know uh, how this works currently. What kind of work comes before the current board? Um, discussion of the budget every, um, you know, the annual budget as we go through the budget process <clears throat> and any discussions about um, personnel and staff um, to some extent and most directly all the policies that are being discussed in the legislature. Okay. Um, but are uh, any permit applications referred up to the current board? No. Okay. No, my role as chair is in um, dealing with appeals and um, enforcement violations, as well as um, you know trying to manage the day to day of the processing in nine districts. Okay. And what kind of appeals currently come to you or the board? What kind of appeals? I mean, are these for jurisdictional opinions or a, an appeals application is denied? Decisions. Appeals yeah. of commission decisions. Um, uh, Greg, help me out here. Um, sure. Yeah. Let, let me, I just wanted to clarify a few things. It's not, and I think, I think we're all, you're all aware of this. Um, the, the Natural Resources Board doesn't currently hear appeals of district commissions or of coordinator decisions regarding jurisdictional opinions. Those appeals both go to the Superior Court Environmental Division, but the Natural Resources Board is a party to those appeals. So to the extent the Natural Resources Board decides to participate in those appeals, and the position that the Natural Resources Board ultimately takes with respect to those appeals, uh, is ultimately up to the Natural Resources Board. And, and just to give a little more background as a, as a practical matter, um, the Natural Resources Board has historically, um, <clears throat> has, a, has historically delegated a, a vast amount of the authority that it has with respect to participation in appeals and enforcement and so forth to the chair directly. So the chair who is in the office day to day, who knows what the issues are, make those sorts of decisions uh, on his or her own uh, without having to defer to the board at large. Okay, thank you. There are, by the way, a couple of appeals, uh, types of appeals that the Natural Resources Board um, has the authority to hear, um, but which literally never have actually come before the board as far as I am aware. Um, including um, a provision that allows uh, applicants to appeal a commission's decision regarding fee waiver requests. Um, the, the board, the Natural Resources Board, also has the authority to hear uh, um, uh, appeals from energy efficiency determinations by the, by the PUC or by, by DPS, by the Department of Public Service. Neither of those types of um, appeals has the Natural Resources Board heard, um, you know, in, in at least the last five, six, seven, eight years. That so, I'm um, Mr. Chair, I just wanted to clarify yes, when I said that as the chair of the Natural Resources Board, I get very involved in appeals. It's in strategic uh, conversation with the legal team, which can take up a significant amount of time. And all I'm trying to say is that there are very complex arguments that come up all the time in terms of, you know, quick decisions need to be made. And I think that it would be very much to the benefit of the overall system if we had this uh, balance between uh, the full-time board and the very informed um, and, and significant uh, influence of, of the local municipalities and, and regional planning. Um, and in terms of district commissions, I'm just trying to, uh, uh, I'll ask this question now, I see Representative Sheldon. Quick question is, so there are nine, uh, nine district commissions, they have a, a 
three active members plus three uh, alternates. Is that right? So total of six per commission. I think it's four alternates, Mr. Chair. Okay, so is it seven then per district? That is that, the that is the, that's the um, that's a statutory um, yeah. circumstance, but not necessarily all of those positions are filled. Okay, so of the total, so that would be uh, sixty-three total district commissioners out there, including alternates. Mm -hmm. Do you do you know currently how many uh, we have of the total potential population of sixty three? Uh, I'm sorry, I don't have a, a you know a number on uh, on the top of my head, but it is all listed on the website, and the current um, uh, terms are are on our uh, NRB Vermont webpage. Okay. Um, well, I, I'm asking because I have heard over time that at different points, it's hard to fill positions or uh, boards uh, may be short a chair for a period of time. That puts a strain on the commission. Other district chairs, district commission chairs end up substituting in kind of like a traveling judge, I suppose. Um, do you know no, if we have- No, that really happened. Do other district chairs don't sit in unless it, you transfer a project to a different district. Okay. So I I don't want you to think it's like you know we just make it up <laughs> because <laughs> it's a pretty what? closely monitored process. Um, All right. Well, I, so obviously I don't know. That's why I'm asking. You know, I I just don't. I'm wondering about the staffing level out in the field. Um, and. Well, I think so, as uh, I've told you in the past, Mr. Chair, uh, I made it my intention following up on my longtime interest in data that helps us understand what the outcomes really are. And I've continued to pursue that and um, look at uh, and an uh, analyze um, how many projects come into each district with what variety of types of projects and what the processing issues are. And I think we have sufficient capacity um, based on recurring numbers um, as we are currently staffed in the district commissions. Okay, great. Um, yeah, I've read your report each year. I don't know if you're working on this year's update. February for... 15th, it's due and you will receive it shortly. <laughs> All right, thank you. Um, thank you for your patience, uh, Representative Sheldon. Uh, sure. I, I think um, I, I'm curious about the volume of applications. I mean, actually, uh, Chair Snelling reminded us we're only adding, actually subtracting board members and adding two, two new paid in this proposal. And I, I, one of the previous witnesses today mentioned something like 400 applicants, applications coming in. A year, 36, six of them were majors, six were appealed, something like that. Um, and I wonder about the capacity of even a professional board to handle the volume of applications that are coming in. So I really don't see that as a problem. I really think when you consider that three full-time people addressing that workload, um, it, it should be possible. And what would their role be in appeals if your a lot of your time is taken up <clears throat> already with these appeals? Well, I How see the, the three member board as the administrative board with the same requirements and capacities as the chair currently has as delegated. Right. Except right? that you'd you'd actually be here, you'd be you'd be making decisions in district commissions. And so that's a huge increase right. in the work. Well, I mean, whatever I'm sorry, I don't mean to speak out of turn. Whatever uh, you know is appropriate in that, uh, if the if the task of the three plus two is to hear <laughs> major applications, I think that's a good fit between that as time spent and the uh, additional time that's necessary to continue to refine and um, improve uh, the outcomes. Do you know how many um, cases the Public Utility Commission hears a year? I don't. Greg, do you Is know? That, I don't know the answer to that question, no. We do hear about 400 applications in a normal year. This past year, as we all know, is not normal in any way. 
um, but um, it was a very steady, uh, uh, you know, flow of work. Thank you. Um, any other questions for uh, the, the NRB, Bo? Oh, team NRB. Um, Mr. Chair, I'm sorry. I just yes. wanted to remind you that um, someone had asked earlier about the uh, precedence of ju jurisdictional opinions. And I think Greg was going to just offer a few comments. Great. Sure. Thanks very much. Yeah, I think, I think Senator Bray, that might have been something you were thinking about um, earlier yeah. in the morning. Um, I, I think maybe your question was whether or not jurisdictional opinions as issued by coordinators are precedential. And the answer to that question is no, they're not. Um, jurisdictional opinions that have been appealed and heard by the Superior Court Environmental Division and then the Supreme Court, um, of course, are, 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 are precedential, uh, as well as uh, opinions, uh, uh, decisions that were issued by the former Environmental Board. Those decisions hold, currently hold the same uh, precedential value as decisions that have been uh, issued by the Superior Court Environmental Division. Okay. Um, and uh, how about applications themselves? I mean, the kind of findings and determinations that are made in an application, do those applications, uh, once approved, um, be, have that sort of precedential value where someone can cite a, a previously issued application as uh, evidence that whatever measure they're proposing on their project should be considered adequate and therefore be uh, awarded uh, uh, an approval. Sure. Those, so um, applications issued by district commissions are, are not themselves precedential. Um, of course, if, if an application uh, and, and a decision issued by the, by the district commission is appealed to the Superior Court yeah. or then the Supreme Court, those decisions would be precedential. Um, certainly, uh, you know, it can be argued that decisions issued by district commissions have some persuasive value in other similarly situated cases, but there is no precedential value to those decisions on their own. Okay. Well, and to be um, direct about it, the part of the reason I was asking those questions was the, um, to respond to the, the consistency question uh, where for, um, for some folks, they see inconsistency in jurisdictional opinions or the handling of a particular application as uh, a negative feature, like they are not the same. Uh, and other people see it as a positive attribute, namely that uh, the local facts on the ground interpreted by that local district commission led to uh, a judgment that was appropriate for those people at that point in time. And so I don't think there's no perfect right or wrong answer on that one, but I, I was trying to figure out the consequences of having quote unquote inconsistency in JOs or applications. Uh, Chair Snelling. Yeah, I, I just wanted to say that, um, you know, uh, Senator McCormick, uh, mentioned this earlier, but from the very beginning of Act 250, the, the error or the issue, the topic of inconsistency versus consistency has been heard very loudly. So I just want also to keep in mind what's a continuum of concern versus an active uh, deterrent, if you will, um, in terms of making the decision. So I think there's actually more consistency and adherence to the law than you might have reported to you. Okay, well, it's true the squeaky complainants are, are uh, noisier than happy customers, right? So, um, uh, Representative Lefebvre, then Representative Dolan. Thank you. Um, my question is, um, does the natural resource board go to court when there is a, an appeal on a district commission's uh, decision? I, Do they I, weigh they, in? 
I'm sorry. I think I heard the question. The question was, does the Natural Resources Board weigh in on appeals from the district commissions? And if, yes. okay, okay, yeah. So yeah, the, yes, the Natural Resources Board does at the court. So appeals from district commissions go directly to the court and um, the Natural Resources Board does typically participate uh, in those appeals. Um, depending on the questions, uh, the legal issues on appeal, there may be some varying level of participation that the Natural Resources Board feels is appropriate, um, to, you know, depending on, on, on those legal questions. But yes, as a, as a, it, typically, um, the, the board will have at least some level of, of participation uh, in, each, in, in each appeal from the district commission. Do you often side with the commission? I'm sorry, can you repeat? Do you, yes. Do you often side with the commission? Um, I would, you know, it's, it's I don't. I mean, just if I may, Greg, I mean, that is what I was trying to explain before the decisions of the current chair um, circumstances, making those decisions and trying to see what's defensible in court. So uh, there, there's a, there's a ongoing review of, of uh, where we can um, succeed and if we value what might become a precedent. Does that answer your question, uh, Representative? Somewhat, yes. I, uh, in, in light of that, does the, does the uh, Natural Resource Board have the authority to hand back a decision to the commissioner and ask them to take another look? No. Can negotiate with the commission before the, it winds up in court? I, I, um, think, I think I'm hearing, um, does the National Resources Board have the authority to send a decision back to the district commission? Uh, and, and no, uh, we, we, don't have, we don't have that sort of authority right now. Um, and I also just wanted to, I wanted to come back to this question of the position that the, the Natural Resources Board might take at the environmental court and whether or not um, that position might be consistent or inconsistent with, um, with the district commission's decision. Uh, and, and this is probably review for most of you. Um, you all know that the, the uh, environmental court hears these applications for Act 250 permits de novo, which means that the that over. essentially forgets about or doesn't even acknowledge what, what was heard below and, and what the decision of the district commission was, which oftentimes sets up a situation where there's actually a different set of facts presented to the environmental court that may have been presented to the district commission. And sometimes those new facts are a result of the district commission's decision. So the applicant may have changed their, may have at least slightly amended their, their project in a manner that would have made their project more uh, amenable to approval by the district commission. So it's, it's sort of difficult for us to say one way or the other whether we support the district commission's decision, because in fact, certain things may have changed in the interim between the application as submitted with the district commission and that which was filed with the, um, and the evidence that's put on um, during a, uh, a, an environmental court hearing. Thank you. Sure. Uh, Representative Dolan. Thank you. Uh, my question is in regards to the consequences should this move forward and the whole concept of reorganization. Uh, when we had talked with the secretary a bit earlier today about this proposal in the executive order, uh, what came up was um, the cost of implementing the executive order. And, um, and I think it was alluded to in the, in the secretary's remarks that there may be some additional actions taken to reorganize the NRB to be able to, um, I think, uh, manage the change in the most cost-effective manner. C can you describe any um, thoughts 
pertaining to that? What additional reorganization is anticipated should this executive order come forward or move forward? I think part of that was uh, relying on one-time funding for this year to support the reorg. And they, they, it appeared or it implied that there was some interest to reorganize the NRB even further to be able to find some cost savings. Hmm. I guess that would be a question for, um, for Ms. Snelling. Yeah, I don't, I really don't think I've heard of this as a cost saving uh, enterprise. Uh, to me, this is about making the decisions be the right decisions that we need to make uh, for the state going forward and the balance between the environment and the economy. So it's not about saving money because quite honestly, I don't, we can't, we can't run any more economically uh, lean than we are at the moment. And I say that having just said, I think we have sufficient um, staffing, which doesn't mean I wouldn't love to contemplate on, on some what if, uh, you know, there could be others, I, I would be able to prepare something. But my point is we, how we work now um, is very lean and the idea is to strengthen the work that we do, not to um, reduce dollars. We don't want to spend any extra though, Representative. Thank you. I, Mr. Um, Chair, if I could respond just briefly on that. Sure, please. Uh, thank you. Uh, yeah, Chair Snelling is exactly right. This is, this is uh, about making Act 250 work uh, efficiently and well in, in achieving its mission. But I think what you may be referring to, Representative Dolan, is there would likely be or may be uh, some capacity at the district coordinator level uh, for them to participate and help in the staff work on applications. And I would defer to the chair and to Greg on that, but, but it seems to me that without majors uh, being at the district commission, they would have some, uh, potentially some capacity to help out on the processing of those at the uh, uh, board level, and I, I stand ready to be corrected by by Greg or, or by uh, or by Chair Snelling on that. But that Mr. Chair, I, I would I would agree. Yes, please. Um, I, I think, if I may. Um, yes, please. I, I recall last year and last year's bill. I know this is a new biennium, but um, but since we did spend significant amount of time thinking about um, part of this executive order, what's contemplated in this executive order. I think at one point we were talking about, or there was discussion about reducing the number of, of district commissions. Is that anticipated as we, if we were to move forward with this executive order? That's not, oh, sorry, go ahead, Chair. No, go ahead, Lewis. I, I... <laughs> I think we're going to say the same thing, which is no, that's not contemplated in the executive order. Uh, over time, would there potentially be some opportunity to have staff assist at, at processing applications at the board level? Yes, but that, that's certainly not part of any discussions I've had. And I, again, I would defer to the chair. Thank you. Yeah, and I would I would say that I my expectation is that coordinators would um, assist the board. So on the major applications, there would be a balance. Uh, one of the questions that came up this morning from one of the district commissioners was if they are going to participate with a full-time professional board, um, would they be uh, a bit of a spare wheel when they are participating on that board, the three plus two? So are you thinking that they would be paid at the same rate so that they would uh, in a certain way, I guess, be uh, treated professionally in terms of pay so that while they're performing those duties at, uh, with the other three, that they would, instead of the 
modest uh, uh, daily honorarium. <laughs> they would. Yeah, no, would I, I absolutely. I, I, uh, to me, that's an important piece. Is that what we're trying to do? Is say this? There's credibility and legitimacy to how these decisions get made, and it's important that the people who are volunteering um, to bring uh, an important local perspective are being paid at a rate that is comparable to their colleagues on the same panel. I mean, I don't think you wanna create a disparity um, on who comes from where based on what they get paid or based what they get paid on where they come from. Um, right. uh, and, um, you know, I think you could easily look at it as potentially uh, some uh, multiple of how uh, the, the two board members, not the chair, but the two board members, uh, whatever their rate of pay is per hour. Okay. You know, so uh, the, my, my uh, I'm intending to say that, that as I, that there would be uh, no disparity between the two types of board members. Thank you. Uh, looking for hands, I see Senator McCormick. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I guess I'm asking this of, of, of um, Chair Snelling, but whoever else might want to answer. Uh, the old uh, environmental board was uh, quasi-judicial, uh, but now you act as um, advocates. You actually intervene. Uh, are you no longer, is, is, is the board no longer quasi-judicial? Um, <clears throat> Greg, I, I think that we uh, retain that authority, but we're not acting in that. Well, I think with respect to, it I think it really depends on, on, on what feature we're talking about that the, that the Natural Resources Board participates in. If we're talking about, um, the activity that we participate in concerning appeals to the Superior Court Environmental Division, we're certainly not quasi-judicial. We act as, um, as any other party might in those proceedings. And is that a, a, an advocacy role or uh, an um, expert role? Well, that's a good question. And I don't know that I'm prepared necessarily to sort of split that hair. Um, we, the, Natural Resources Board decides um, whether or not and to what extent it might want to participate in, um, in any appeal and, um, and, and, and will advocate its position one way or the other um, based on past precedent and law. So to, you know, to the extent you want to call it um, expert, uh, expert advice to the Supreme court or or advocacy you know i'm not i'm not sure how to how, how to label it one, one way or the other do you go in on your own initiative or, are you, or does someone call you as a witness okay no 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 we're not we're certainly not witnesses um but yes the natural resources board will participate on its own initiative that and that that authority is delegated from the from the board to the chair and the chair ultimately decides based on the opinion, you know, ba based on um, input from either myself or my colleague, Evan Meenan, um, as to how, how we might want to participate and to what extent we might want to participate. Um, you know, from time to time, the court may ask the Natural Resources Board for its opinion and may to brief a certain matter, um, but it's rare that the court would affirmatively ask the, the board for such a, for such a brief. Do do you tend to support appellants or to support uh, the commissions? I wouldn't say there was a balance one way or another or, or a, a direction one way or another. I think for me, making the decision on whether to represent something and brief the court is about the value of the evidence. And if I feel the evidence is sound and that the decision has been, um, you know, all aspects of the decision have been considered, then I feel it's worth it. Um, uh, but I have been confronted uh, on, on numerable occasions with decisions that have um, 
opportunities for substantial, um, um, uh, you know, uh, cr criticism and um, open to a possibility of a losing in court and setting a precedent that we don't want to set. So there's that uh, kind of perspective as well as how do we invest our energy and resources to promote the best precedents of policy, policy going forward and not um, ex overexpose ourselves to losing in court. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Hey, um, so I didn't want to interrupt. Uh, we've gone past a time where we would have taken a break, but I do want to just take a five minute break and then we'll come back and finish for the morning. Um, while you're making tea or taking a little walk or whatever, let me just float out something for you to think about. Uh, and that is what questions, I mean, the committees will handle them individually, but what questions do we have and who do we want to hear from? in order to help us get answers uh, to those questions. And maybe we can have that discussion when we come back, we'll check in with legislative council to hear their thinking based on what they've heard in testimony today, and then we'll wrap up uh, before noon. So let's take a five minute break. Uh, see you at 11.37. So let's jump back in. Thank you, everyone. Uh, so I think we're only gonna go another 10 minutes or so just to finish. Um, Wanted to, we have council with us and uh, I wanted, you know, the, the two questions I floated out uh, that I think would be helpful for all of us to hear put on one table would be, you know, what questions do we have? And, and then following up from those, from whom do we need to hear in order to answer those questions? So, um, I, you know, I have, I'll start with prime to pump with two questions. One is, with questions around the constitutionality of the current statute, what's the legislature's usual reaction? I mean, for instance, there must have been laws found unconstitutional and we changed them in the state of Vermont, but um, the, nothing has been brought directly to us. Uh, there, there's apparently a case that's going, been, a uh, suit been brought on this already related to it. Uh, so I think I'm looking to ledge council to help provide us for guidance. What would our ordinary procedure be to uh, my sense is we would operate under our current understanding of current law until directed otherwise by the courts. Um, so let me put that question on the table and maybe we can get just a, a brief answer to that. Um, and then I'll let's go around and see if there are other questions floating out there. Um, I, I, well, I don't think we can't, I can't hear you, Mr. Martland. No. Not, not yet. Well, Mr. Martland is, is, uh, Working on his technology, Mr. Chair, uh, may I just mention that I, I I hope that you know if it does if it is determined that it's really only one committee one body that needs to deal with this that that decision will then be made and so that both bodies aren't um, working on something that they don't need to be working on, if you will. Okay. Well, and. To your point, there is always the possibility of this proposal being offered as a bill by any uh, member of the General Assembly. So of course, of course. there's no way that we're precluding a discussion on it, but um, this is, we've been put into a different posture, like the, the clock running out, etc. cetera. Uh, so uh, Mr. Martland, let's see if you're- Yes, can you hear me now? Yes, yes. sir. I apologize about that. I had to change a microphone setting. So you were correct, Mr. Chair. Uh, the scenario is you have a law on the books uh, that is currently valid. A case has just been filed that may challenge it, but the law is currently valid. It has not been overturned, nor has it been stayed. 
and you will you should operate under that law. And that law clearly states a one body resolution is sufficient to disapprove this executive order. If this committee or any other committee wants to go into the constitutional issues, would be glad to, but I don't think you need to for purposes of considering this executive order. Okay, thank you. Um, anyone else in the room have a question that's emerged out of listening to this morning's testimony, whether we can get an answer right now like that, or if it requires research, then we can ask Ledge Council to come back or others to come back to us in the future. Senator McCormick. Thanks. Uh, Luke, were the statute under which we operate to be found unconstitutional, what, how would that finding affect <clears throat> action that we had previously taken under the now unconstitutional statute? I think it would depend uh, whether the whole uh, chapter is uh, held unconstitutional or only parts thereof. In other words, whether there's a severability analysis applied, so that would be relevant. It also might depend on the court's ruling. Um, so it's hard to predict. I don't know if it would invalidate what you've done. If, you've, if you pass a resolution disapproving the EO, it doesn't go into effect. And so it, nothing would change. If you allow the executive order to go into effect and then the statute is held unconstitutional, maybe there would be um, repercussions, but we'd just have to see. And please remember that we've advised you that if you allow the executive order to go into effect, you should amend other statutes to make sure they conform to the executive order. Yeah. We want everything to be uh, harmonious. We don't want conflicts between the executive order and statute down the road. Okay, just for, I just wanna make sure I've got it. If hypothetically, and I, un and I understand I'm asking for a conjecture, hypothetically one house disapproves the executive order, the other house remains silent. Under the present statute, that would invalidate the executive order. Were the court later to then decide that that one house provision is unconstitutional, would the executive order then go into effect? Negative. I do not believe so. It would still be disallowed? Yes. Even though the disallowing was unconstitutional. Yeah, yes, and, and I think we're getting a little far afield. We can talk about this in more detail if you want to go into those issues. But I would think that if the statute is held unconstitutional, the whole statute falls, which includes the mechanism to bring an EO to the General Assembly to reorganize the executive branch. Okay, uh, I, I, I would hope, Mr. Chairman, maybe not now, but I would like to go deeper into this. Hypothetically, <laughs> were we to decide that we don't like the executive order, uh, I would want us to make sure to err on the side of caution that we did it in a way that would be sustained regardless. Uh, in other words, uh, two houses would be better than one. Thanks, Mr. Chairman. Um, thank you. Uh, and uh, Representative Dolan and then Representative Lefebvre. Uh, just a quick question. Is there a difference between an executive order and a bill with respect to the constitutionality issues that were raised? I can see, obviously, with a bill, we the legislature has a constitutional role there with a bicameral um, two, two house um, approach to passing that bill. But when you're dealing with an executive order, is there a, a is it treated differently under um, the whole question of constitutionality? I think that's the crux of the issue. And so once again, we're glad to talk about the constitutional issues. Um, I think there's good arguments on either side, but I think there's a gray area there. And Representative Dolan, that would be one of the key questions. Is the same bicameral requirement apply or not? But once again, we're sort of <laughs> backing into this extended conversation. So if you wanna go into it, we can reappear before any committee and go into it in detail. And you can hear from the executive branch, but 
I had the impression the chair just sort of wanted to lay out issues at this point. So I don't want to end up going on and on and getting into it in depth that that's okay. Right. So thank you. It's a good question. And well, I think we're obviously a complicated one. So we'll, the two committees will make decisions about how, how to dig into this further. Um, Representative Lefebvre. Uh, yes, thank you. Um, is there any bright line uh, that we could go by to determine whether or not an executive order has surpassed a, re, uh, a reorganization? Ellen, do you want to take that? I think that's something you touched on earlier. Do you... uh, yeah, so I, I think the answer is no. Um, I think that reorganization is not defined under the statute 3 VSA 2002. And I think uh, there are arguments, there can be multiple arguments made about what falls into that specifically. So there hasn't been any case law further defining it. So we don't have a bright line, no. Okay. Thank you. Um, I have a question. Uh, um, Ms. Smith this morning cited, it was an interesting thing she brought up, I think it was Act 246, if I'm remembering, the law that established this uh, ability to reorganize in 3 VSA 2002, et cetera, or Chapter 41. Um, and it talked about things like increasing uh, responsiveness to the public, et cetera. Uh, anyway, there were some features in there and they were in findings, I believe in that original law. And I'm wondering about the, to what degree do the findings of that law influence our, you know, uh, are they just informational for us or do they have any kind of legal force? Like, do they, do they create in essence a set of criteria against which we could judge the suitability or unsuitability of the proposal currently in front of us. Is that a question you want us to answer? Or are you throwing that uh, on no, the table? I, for yeah, I would like to hear from council on that one. I just don't know if how to use that information uh, that's contained in the original legislation that is driving the whole thing today. I think it's something you certainly could look at if you wish. I mean, legislative findings are intended to either give background on why you're passing a bill, why you think it's important, and or how that bill should be interpreted if there's litigation or applied in the real world. Mm -hmm. So yes, you can absolutely look at legislative findings and sometimes courts look at legislative findings to understand how a bill should be interpreted and applied. So you could Right. Uh, look at them. They're not binding. They're not like the substantive codified law that says what people can do or not do. Um, so it's a little different, but you could look at them. Okay, thank you. Also, I would just quickly add, I looked at them. Um, I didn't fully uh, dive deep and spend a lot of time on them, but I did look to see if they clarify reorganization at all. And I did not see at least initially anything further clarifying that aspect. So um, Ms. Smith was referencing um, sort of an interesting tie to um, the citizens of Vermont, which sort of tied into Act 250. Um, and that was sort of a different issue, but I don't think it at least initially didn't strike me as helping further define what is included in reorganization. Okay, thank you. Um, Anyone else have any question you want to get on the table, whether we're trying to answer it now or just identify some things for us to learn a little more about before when we come back to this. All right, I'm not seeing any other hands and it is 10 right. 12, so that was a goal. Uh, Representative Lefebvre? No, fine, I'm fine, thank you. Okay. Um, so with that, I'd just like to say thank you to everyone for participating this morning and um, deepening the conversation. And uh, the, I will be in touch with Chair Sheldon and so that we try to keep the two committees a little bit in sync as we work, even though they're individual questions to each committee. 
So it's good to see you all, and thanks for pitching in as a uh, it was a perfect a perfect opportunity to have a joint meeting. So thank you again. Thank you.